Okay, everybody, should we get this show on the road? Yes. yes. <laughs> uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Cheryl Heller, chair of MFA, Design for Social Innovation. Uh, when we launched this program, we had no model for what a thesis was in social design. We knew our own practice and we knew social innovation, but we had nothing to look at for a model because no one had ever done one that we knew of. And so the first year the students said, well, what are we supposed to do? What is a thesis? What is a thesis in social design? And we did what any sensible teacher does. We threw the question back at them and said, well, aren't you lucky you get to figure that out? That was seven years ago. And since then, we've had over 90 alums complete this their thesis project so far. We have more context and more range. There are more examples for students to look at. And there's more to draw inspiration from. Every year, the projects get better and better. And this year is no exception. We've also seen over all these years the role that the thesis plays in a designer's education. It's the culmination of everything they've learned and more than that, it's the biggest opportunity they have to put everything they've learned into practice in the real world. To shift from understanding something in theory to mastering it by applying it. They learn to navigate uncertainty, to make progress through inquiry, to set a target to get somewhere with absolutely no idea how they'll do that when they begin. And most important, these thesis projects become a launch pad for what the students do after they graduate. They are the evidence of the experience they've garnered. And they help to create the roles that, that our alums are playing out in the world in a variety of fields. As the chair, I get to see people from the first day they walk in when they do a five minute presentation to introduce themselves what, 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 everything they are to date um, until about 480 days later when they sit here waiting to present their thesis projects. So I get to see the shedding of cocoons and the unlearning and the learning again and the distillation and uh, the concentration of character and, and the desires that they bring with them into the program. This requires a very particular set of skills and rigor and practice. You're going to see their work. Uh, you'll see a 10 minute presentation of the culmination of countless hours and sweat and tears often. But the real outcome and the important work of this program is the transformation of the people themselves. They become listeners and creators and synthesizers and researchers and leaders who know how and why to go about doing something about what bothers them. Thank you all for coming. Thank all the faculty for dedicating themselves to the program and to all of our students. Thanks most especially to the thesis faculty, who you will hear from later on, for caring so deeply about the students and guiding them through this process. Those of you who are here with us and watching the live stream are about to see programs that make life better for cancer survivors, intervene in the flow of ocean-bound plastics, improve the healthcare experience for patient, patients and staff in prisons, connect people on the autism spectrum through making, they bring visibility and equity to unmarried women in China, facilitate conversations about sexual health between mothers and daughters, engage young people in curtailing food waste, support artists and craftspeople from other cultures, support black women through cultural sensitivity and empowerment, protect canners and the future of local recycling, reclaim a South Bronx park from an opioid crisis, build confidence in stutterers, connect and support seniors in nursing homes, and provide access to vital services for non-native English speakers. So Chu Yao and Nishita, Andrea, Geraldine, Lang, Mayu, Sun Yang and Phoenix, Amanda, Yuka, Sandy, Alejandro, Lerong, Jinwei, Nick and Male, Pim, Rudia, Stephen, Jesse and Sophia. Thank you for all your hard work. It's been an honor to watch you become the amazing social designers you are. And now you can take it away.
Okay. What's up? 2018. Um, my name is Archie Lee Coates IV. Um, I am part of the uh, amazing Core 4 thesis faculty. Um, in 2002, I went off to college at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia to study design with a complete sense of exploration, a desperate desire to learn about how and why to make things, and with no idea what I'd find. What I found was a lot of resources, tools, books, and faculty telling me one very specific thing, that there are no rules, and when you see them, to break them. They encouraged me to find my own way, to look within myself and to understand what I believed to be true to reach out to people and ask questions, and as a designer, to try to answer them as earnestly, carefully, and simply as I could. The Design for Social Innovation program at School of Visual Arts is no different. And I've had the absolute privilege of advising thesis students since the first graduating class. In these walls at this school, I tell my students not to focus on the bad, but to look intensely at what's there, to ask earnest questions about it in a way most people don't take the time to do to talk to people with fervor, to be compassionate but honest, until in all that bad they find one good thing that no one else can see and then make it louder. All that is asked of them is simple. To make that one good thing so loud and so accessible that it's the only thing that people can hear. To do that is obviously and painfully hard. There is no script, there is no book, there is no equation, there is no philosophy that can completely guide you through this process of design. Instead, we have lots of faculty that have spent quality time outside those doors doing the same things we're asking of these students. The key for these students is knowing that it isn't impossible to simply be themselves, which are human beings, to think about other people, to be honest with themselves, to be loving, and to work so damn hard until you feel something start to change. I am very, very thankful to have spent the past year learning from and with Choyal, Ishida, Andrea, and Gerilyn. Each one of these students asks tough and inspiring questions, most of which I cannot answer, but only guide them through it. They are brave, passionate, and gifted human beings that have approached topics many designers wouldn't dare to. Choyal and Ishida, you started somewhere much different than where you ended up, and that took incredible courage. You got dirty, literally. You focused on a small population, asked deep questions, and when the answer looked different than you thought it'd be, you didn't run from it. And now Canner's stories are being illuminated along with their pride. Andrea, wow. You started with an earnest and protective love of parks and ended up digging into one of the largest issues affecting not only this city, but cities everywhere. Like most of your peers, the process took you on a journey you did not expect, and you navigated it with grace. I know sometimes the small victories don't feel that large, but they are. You should feel and be extremely proud. Gerilyn, you are incredible. I think everybody knows that. And the way in which you approached your work these past two semesters has been inspirational to me. You approached the thesis process by the book, and when the, when the book had no more answers, you threw it out. You listened, really listened, to the young black women that so desperately needed to be heard, and you gave them the tools to build their own community. Choi Awashita, Andrea, and Gerilyn, this is only the beginning. You're going to go much further than this, and I can't wait to see where that is. from China. And I'm Ishita from India. Um, now, we are not going to talk about our country's booming population. Well, it is a really big problem, but we have more things in common. Do you know there's 600,000 tons of recyclable waste generated here in New York City every year that is sent to India and China? So this triggered our interest in New York City's recycling system. At first, we were fascinated about like huge pickup trucks and these fancy sorting machines. But then we found we also have these people, these people, and these people. 
we are very familiar with them in our countries, but we want to we wondered what is their role in New York City. We learned that in 1982, before we had curbside recycling in the city, New York State introduced a bottle bill. According to this bill, when we buy a can of Coke or any other beverage, we pay an extra five cent deposit for the container that we're eligible to redeem back when we return the container. The bill is a measure to incentivize us consumers to reduce litter and to make beverage companies accountable for their waste. But how many of us really go and return our cans and bottles? And so the bill has turned unintentionally into a new means of livelihood for thousands of unemployed and retired people in the city, creating a new subculture called canning. And the people who redeem these cans and bottles are called canners. Maria is one such canner. We met Maria at Show We Can a nonprofit redemption center in Brooklyn. She came to the United States 30 years ago with a dream. She currently works part-time at a church. Maria has two sons, Matthias and David. David is in fifth grade and hopes to go to college one day. Working part-time on minimum wage does not provide Maria, a single mother, the resources that she needs to raise her two sons. And so Maria started collecting cans and bottles. Maria told us that canning is not always a stable source of income. So to understand canners better, we started by asking if we can help them collect, sort, count, and redeem cans. We found that canning is even harder than we imagined. It requires rummaging through the trash and all sorts of unpleasant things. So um, we were, and also we, for, we were forced to strip down our pride, be vulnerable and immune to everything people think or th th said about us. We were intimidated. So we thought canning is the problem. If we can help them get out of this, get better opportunities to earn money, then this problem is solved. We spend a lot of time thinking this way, thinking about how we could provide access to better opportunities and financial stability to this community. But after talking to many, many canners, we realized that in fact, canning was better access to opportunities for these people because it made it helped them get the extra money they needed over their social security to pay for rent or to pay for children's education or to save for their grandchildren. Like David Kallick says, when you're pushed to the edge, collecting cans might be the only thing you can do. While it's not the best job in the world, it has gotten Maria by for the last 10 years. And this learning was a pivotal moment in our research. Canning is not the problem. Canning is the solution for Maria and for 7,000 canners in the city. The focus of our project completely shifted. If canning is providing livelihood to so many people, then how do we recognize this job? While curbside recycling only takes care of the recyclables in recycling bags, canners divert a huge amount of recyclables from the trash that would otherwise end up going to the landfill. While this is not measured, this really helps the city reach greater recycling goals. However, canners are not valued by any of the key stakeholders. The city blamed the canners for collecting recyclables from the curbside recycling bags because it means less income for the city, but they ignore the contributions canners make. And the general public are indifferent to canners. They don't think canning is a serious job for someone. Also, canners themselves has been marginalized and stigmatized for such a long time that they don't see their own value. We found there's two major gaps between these two sides, and because of which, canners are not valued. Firstly, canners are not a recognized group, so there's no study on canners in New York City. Even though we see canners diverting recyclables from the landfill, their contribution are not being quantified. Also, canners has the potential to create jobs, 
reduce poverty, and even save the city's money. However, there's no research to prove these social and economic advantages. Secondly, there's no communication to share a new perspective. So people continue to perpetuate the misconceptions. Public attitudes and public policies are often based on these misconceptions, like canning is disorganized, so there's no economic or environmental impact. In order to fill these gaps so that canners are seen as contributing members of society, we built Canversation, an interactive walking tour with a mission to make New Yorkers see their canners. We created a walking tour because it's fun, and it's a great way for people to get to see the number of cans and bottles that are being diverted by canners every day. We don't believe that any community is voiceless, so the walking tour is led by canners themselves and is a platform for them to share their stories. Our target, our target audience is students and professionals in sustainability, policy, and design who value recycling, do research projects, and have the ability to influence policy in the long run. Currently, the ways to get information about canners include documentaries and articles. However, these are not enough to inspire research or shift misconception. And so the walking tour makes sure that people get clarity on the current recycling system and the role of canners, shift biases through honest conversations with the canners, and give people a chance to experience scanning firsthand. The response we got from the four tours that we conducted exceeded our expectations. Yes, the tour was featured in Untapped Cities, a sightseeing tour agency in New York City. Our participants are already working on projects such as unionizing canners. And a shout out to Christina in the audience, who's making a short film about the canning ecosystem after being inspired by the tour. People confess that the tour made them see canners differently. I used to think all canners are homeless or drug addicts. This has changed everything I knew. The rich interactions and the demand that the tour generated shows that it has potential to inspire research, change the way New Yorkers see their canners, as well as the potential to be financially sustainable. On the Earth Day gathering in Shuri Ken, we shared this idea to more canners in the community. And like Anna, the founder of Shuri Ken, you there? Yes, she said, uh, you created an alternative for people to open their minds to other realities. Um, we, there's a lot of interest to con continue this tour, and we are also in the conversation with Shuri Ken to take this forward. Imagine if you can join a walk led by a canner you often see in your own neighborhood. We want to scale this to more areas and more languages. We believe that if we can shift the public attitude and show the contribution canners make, we'll have a stronger argument to influence the public policies and the government perspective. And with that, ultimately, we can advocate to integrate canners in our waste management system as local recyclers. So instead of just looking at canners as people who just collect cans and bottles, we should look at their potential and look at what they are capable of doing. They see the value in waste, and they are hardworking. They are very adaptable. So what if there's more incentives on other recyclables? Imagine how many coffee cups we can divert from the landfill. And also imagine how many people in difficulties can benefit from this. And all these start with conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is Andrea. 
Um, and I've been living and working in New York City for about eight years now. And throughout this entire time, uh, New York City's parks have been my refuge from the stress and anxiety of city life. And that's Cooper, by the way. Um, he's hanging out with me in Central Park, and he also likes parks. <laughs> I think most of us city dwellers would agree that our parks are an integral part of the city. But some may not realize that urban green spaces actually are critical to neighborhood health. Research shows us that access to green space in cities may actually contribute to diverse health benefits, including improved air quality, greater physical activity, stress reduction, and social cohesion. There's also evidence that urban green space may be equigenic, which means the connection between the health benefits and access to green space may be strongest among lower socioeconomic groups say, in a neighborhood like Mott Haven <clears throat> in the South Bronx, where 43% of residents live in poverty, making it the third poorest neighborhood in New York City. And because where we live greatly impacts our health, not surprisingly, Mott Haven also has some of the poorest health outcomes in the city, including high rates of hospitalization for diabetes and asthma, and generally low levels of physical activity. Thus, for communities in Mott Haven, the safety and accessibility of local green spaces are a health priority. Spaces like St. Mary's Park. With 35 acres of rolling hills and ball fields <clears throat> and playgrounds, St. Mary's has the potential to be a great park. But it continues to face many safety, health, and social challenges. Of which, the most noticeable, the most urgent, and the most rapidly growing one is this. In case it's hard to see, that is a used syringe on the ground with the needle tip still exposed. Uh, it was discarded by someone who was using heroin sh just shortly before this photo was taken. And the community is obviously taking notice. Many families are reluctant to bring their children to St. Mary's, even during the day. <clears throat> to quantify this issue, St. Mary's staff is picking up 1,400 syringes per week, so about 200 syringes per day, and that number is only going up. But the issue is even so much greater than just St. Mary's Park, <clears throat> where I started my research. At least 13 other public spaces in the South Bronx have been increasingly experiencing this issue over the past two years. <clears throat> and that's because drug use, especially in public places, has been growing alongside our national opioid epidemic, which in 2016 killed about 64,000 Americans. And although New York City hasn't experienced the worst of the country's epidemic, <clears throat> still about seven hours, every seven hours, someone dies from overdose in New York City. And nearly three quarters of those deaths are due to opioids or the synthetic version, fentanyl. And as with most public health issues, the lowest income communities bear the biggest burden of disease. In 2016, four out of the five neighborhoods with the highest rates of opioid overdose were in the Bronx. And out of all the neighborhoods in New York City, Hunts Point, Mott Haven, right here, had the highest rates of drug overdose over the course of 2015, 2016. So in other words, St. Mary's Park lies at the epicenter of the opioid crisis in New York City. Thus, it was important for me to acknowledge that syringes on the ground at St. Mary's were not really the problem here, but rather a symptom of a much larger, more complex issue, and therein lies the actual solution. When we look at who is working to relieve uh, drug parks of drug use and syringes in Bronx parks <clears throat> on intersecting scales of human-centered approach versus symptom versus problem, we can see that while they're all working hard to respond to the crisis, the initiatives are heavily focused on mitigating the symptoms rather than addressing the problems um, and being created uh, up, uh, from top-down organization little approach instead of human-centered approach. Uh, and for now, I want to talk about this one, the Bronx Park's syringe disposal I've been working with Vulnerable Communities Task Force. They assembled for the first time this past January and have been meeting at Lincoln Hospital monthly since then to tackle the <clears throat> discarded syringe problem and get help to users stationed in South Bronx Parks. Their approach to this problem is three-pronged. <clears throat> It involves conducting an in-depth health assessment of uh, people who use drugs, or as up here you'll read, PWUDs, um, installing three different kinds of disposal units in 13 Bronx parks, 
and st strategizing generally on outreach, uh, disposal maintenance, and health promotion. And although such groups are associated with slow and painful bureaucracy, I wanted to work with this group because I saw an incredible opportunity to work with a group of people who are passionate, committed stakeholders, already gathered together in a room around a common problem, seeking a common goal, and are not afraid to challenge each other, and who are deeply passionate about their community. One of the first things I noticed at the monthly meetings was what groups were represented in the room, and of course, which ones weren't. Who was speaking for the people who use drugs themselves? Of course I realized that integrating the voice of drug users is not a simple task in execution. But to me, it represented a bigger opportunity for design to work within the group and help it evolve from working over here to over here. And to that end, I introduce Estuvo Aki. It is the process of introducing social design into this collaborative effort of improving public park safety in order to shift the focus from the symptoms of public injection and discarded syringes to the urgent needs and health of the most vulnerable people using drugs. The name of the program was inspired by a quote from one of my design champions along this process, Pia from New York Harm Reduction Educators. Uh, she once said to me, if there's a syringe on the ground, that means there was a person there. And so we need to ask, how can we reach that person and provide them the services they need? And this arrow represents the general direction that we're moving in together, shifting from the question of how do we solve the discarded syringe problem to what do people who use drugs in the parks need most? And by working together to introduce a more human-centered approach to the task force, it will naturally bring, a, bring our work closer to solving the problem as well. One of the first design tools we explored in this process uh, of becoming more human-centric was stakeholder mapping, something we're all very familiar with. Um, independently and then together, we worked on naming and organizing all the different groups who have stake in the issue of public injection, not just those who are in the room here, um, but also humans who are at the center of the issue, the drug users, the park users, actual experts, and other stake secondary stakeholders who are not in the task force but could be potential allies within this process. <clears throat> By mapping stakeholders, we've started to evolve and um, dis discover that the task force has actually been operating within its own silo, even though there are other community groups, other coalitions who are working to tackle the same itch issues and can potentially collaborate with us. It has also become clear that there is potential for more diversity in the task force, not least of all a voice from the act active users themselves. In response to this mapping activity, uh, the, the, some members of the task force said, we never even thought to incorporate the experiences of people like the principal at the school across the street from the park or just people walking around in the park. Hearing their perspectives would actually be really valuable. And the map continues to be a living document as updated um, as the collective task force understanding of the stakeholder landscape grows. In March, I was invited to speak with harm reduction participants, many of whom are act actively injecting, at the syringe exchange vans in Mott Haven and Tremont. My goals for these interviews was <clears throat> not to quickly start drilling down about syringe disposal behaviors, but actually to get to know each individual participant. What are they passionate about? How do they like to express themselves? What is their idea of community? How do they experience stigma? <clears throat> and that's where I met Catherine a petite, soft-spoken woman who stopped by the syringe exchange site to, to pick up clean syringes and take advantage of other services provided there, such as testing her, testing her supply for fentanyl. She and I did talk about syringes. She said she personally injects at home and afterward, if she doesn't have access to a sharps container or a drop-off location, she'll break the tip off the syringe, break the syringe in half, wrap it all in a brown bag, and then tie all that in a plastic bag and walk them to the nearest street garbage can. But I also learned that Catherine is a true New Yorker, born and raised in Queens, and she's about to turn 50 years old and wants to go back to school in September to fulfill her dream of becoming a writer. She told me that she started using heroin when she was with her first husband, who also abused and has since passed away from drug-related complications. She's trying to get on a Suboxone recovery program, but it's now very difficult insurance-wise, and few programs are taking new patients. She's actually been turned away from detox programs, before, because they say she doesn't use enough heroin to qualify. Like I said, she's really petite. She says, my life's a mess, and I don't wish addiction on my enemies, but I'm not ready to give up. I know I can do this. 
And I feel a little bit lighter saying these things to someone who genuine, genuinely cares, so thank you. I heard 14 other difficult and moving stories like Catherine's. There were themes that started to develop from the participants' conversations such as that the stigma surrounding drug use in parks is very strong, especially within the drug use community. There are extremes. I also learned that many people who use drugs don't trust any services, not even harm reduction, who many consider very approachable service. They rely solely on strong networks of other people using drugs for supplies and information. And I learned that current task force initiatives will likely serve many people, but still not the most vulnerable po populations who are those using in parks. <clears throat> When looked at as a whole, these conversations with participants seemed to lather up to one overarching insight, which was that there are subsets of people who use drugs who have different behaviors, needs, and attitudes. The most vulnerable, most vulnerable of these groups who are using in parks aren't being reached. <clears throat> when we talked about this reality at one of the task force meetings and one of the harm reduction professionals present said, you know, we always kind of had a feeling there were people out there needing help who we just weren't seeing, and now we know. Uh, and we, are, we were working on this one project, um, developing flyers to disseminate information about the new disposal and health services coming out. Um, but instead of flyers, we'll now be distributing the information on stickers attached to the needle packs themselves, um, since the messages are more likely to permeate through the um, user networks that way than, rather than approaching the harm reduction site. <clears throat> As a result of the insights from this participatory research, we're now diving into some segmentation techniques, one of which is creating se semantic profiles for the different participants. Based on the interviews, these nine different recurring attributes of user identities were selected for comparison. For example, trust in outreach services again, and pres presence of basic needs like a uh, home. <clears throat> then low to high scales were defined for each attribute, and then each participant was plotted as a point along the scale based on their association with that attribute. Then patterns could be loosely assessed along the shapes of each vertical line. Perhaps the most important discovery from this activity was that the participants who are approaching harm reduction for services are not the same people who are injecting in parks. <clears throat> and now we're beginning to more clearly define and fill in the gaps of the most vulnerable users on whom we have very little information. And this activity revealed a, a, a need to more deeply include them in this process. <clears throat> so in a couple months, we're moving along and the task force will conduct a focus group with people actively using drugs. While the goal and the format of the focus group is still up for discussion, the group has acknowledged that using this framework will be integral for recruiting participants. It has helped us realize that our biases and assumptions must not determine who we're bringing into the room, and we must make sure that the most vulnerable users are represented. And our work is far from done. Now that the disposal units are starting to be installed in parks as of literally a couple days ago, there's an opportunity as a group to realign our goals and to continue to maximize the impact that collaborative design can have on the community. And the work we're doing here, this is just for 13 parks in one city. Imagine if we could share our design approach with other boroughs in New York City and better yet other cities uh, in this country who we know are grappling with the overwhelming issues of one of the biggest drug epidemics in American history. Perhaps then, more people struggling through addiction could stay alive and healthy long enough to choose to enter a recovery process. At that point, returning parks to their roles as places that com support community health and happiness, no matter where you live. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> my name is Geraldine Powell, and I would like to present my thesis project, 32 Flavors of Black Women. The strong black woman is easily recognizable. 
She confronts all trials and tribulations. She is a source of unlimited support for her family. She is a motivated, hardworking breadwinner. She is always prepared to do what needs to be done for her family and for her people. She is sacrificial and smart. She suppresses her emotional needs while anticipating the needs of others. She has an irrepressible spirit that is unbroken by a legacy of oppression, poverty, and rejection. This quote appears in Sister Citizen by Melissa Harris Perry as she goes to explore the identity of what it means to be a black woman. So what does it mean to be a black woman in America? You may think it looks like this. Because right now, being a black woman in America is trending. But every day, black women are faced with derogatory assumptions about their character and their identity. As the world around them demands that they be accommodating and resist being their authentic selves in order to be recognized. Black women have feelings of inferiority that are within themselves, but also from external sources. This double consciousness as defined by W.E. Du Bois makes it very difficult as one tries to figure out who they are. The strong black woman is a role and an image that we all conform to for our nation, our communities, our families, other black women, and even for ourselves. But we aren't always strong. We don't always speak loud. We don't always create magic. And we are not a single story. As I set out to discover to solve a very different problem and look at what it's like to develop one's self-identity in the process of self-discovery and thinking about what your future looks like, I sat in a room with four young black women who told me what it was like for them to go through this process of self-discovery. And what I realized is that black women face unique challenges and problems. They doubt themselves because they don't fit into the stereotypes or expectations of what a black woman is supposed to look like, act like, and sound like. There is division among us by the layers of identity based on our physical attributes, emotional, and other insecurities that we face. What these young women lack is a place to decide and declare who they are. They want to know who they are, what they like, and where they're headed. But one's identity isn't just about how you see yourself. It's also influenced by the interaction you have with others. So it is important to have someone who understands you, who gets you, who looks like you. It's important that black women feel good about what it means to be a black woman first before they can find who they really are inside so that they develop a self-confidence within themselves to overcome the stereotypes and find a place where they can seek affirmation, they can have be inspired by others and gain a perspective that they can only get from other black women. Because we all know that no person is an island. We all need feedback. And these young women especially yearn to be affirmed in who they were and what they were experiencing. Black women need a safe space to regularly explore their self-identity. They need to be heard, accepted, and validated during this process of self-discovery. In many organizations, there exist groups that are called affinity groups. And these groups are based on some common identity, such as race, gender, or entrance. These groups allow for people to experience a place where they can belong, a place where they can be supported, 
where they can be understood and acknowledged for the experiences that they're having. It's a place that promotes their self-identity. It's a place that they become more empathetic to the things around them and their experiences. And it's also a place where they gain information and able to find a network of people like them. Currently, these types of groups exist for black women. There are sororities, there are professional organizations, and there are even interest groups like Black Girls Run and Black Girls Code. But they're bound by age, educational and professional status, social class, and interests. So what happens to women who don't fit these areas? What happens to the girl who doesn't go to college or the woman who's retired and no longer has a professional organization to be a part of? I would like to introduce 32 Flavors of Black Women. 32 Flavors creates a space for Black women to explore their identity together. It's a safe space where conversation and activities lead Black women into understanding who they are and being affirmed in their multifaceted identity. Through a series of activities and workshops, Together, we explored our different layers of identity. One activity in this workshop allowed women to create their own flavor, to say who they were, how they identify, and then share those experiences with the women in the room. One of the favorite activities of the participants was being able to show those feelings by showing how they were similar to someone else to be able to use marbles as a way to say, I support you, I'm like you, and I'm with you. These sessions also became a place for the hard discussions about what it's like to be faced with the everyday challenges of being a black woman. We talked about race, we talked about our hair, we talked about body types and body sizes, and we talked about just what it's like living in Memphis and being a black woman. This was also a place where there was emotional and instrumental support for each other, for us to share about what we needed and how we could help each other. Through these activities, women were able to see just how diverse they are and realize that there are so many different flavors of Black women. It was an opportunity to share stories among generational groups. It was a place for self-reflection as well as a, a reminder that we are not alone. They were able to acknowledge and validate each other's experiences, and then also given a place to think about their identity and remember that being a black woman is special because what black women really are, are hidden in plain sight, enjoying life, organized chaos, and more importantly, black women are enough. It is my hope that this session can be repeated and taken to other countries, sorry, other cities, <laughs> states, and other places where black women can have safe spaces to dialogue together about who they are, to be affirmed, that be, to be affirmed and be proud of what it means to be a black woman in America, and then to find the unique things that make them each special. I would like to thank my thesis advisor, Archie Coates, my program director, Cheryl Heller, the participants who participated in my focus groups, F plus creativity for space and strategic support. I would like to thank Karen Proctor, the DSI staff, my DSI cohort, my babies, and my first year babies. <laughs> The Single Moms Club, Andrea and Amanda, for supporting us, each other, and holding each other up. I would also like to thank Dr. Mary Palmer, Dr. Monica Dillihunt, my mom, my sister, and my fiance. Thank you so much for your support through this process. Hello.
impossible to follow that. Um, so I will attempt. Hello, uh, my name is Benedetta Piantella the first. Um, but I very quickly became Benny for you all. Um, this was my first year admiring the thesis process unfold here at DSI. And I feel incredibly best I got to walk alongside you all this year. Thank you, Cheryl and the faculty for a wonderful opportunity. Designing for impact is a path and a laborious process. And thesis is about challenging yourself and mastering such process. Thesis is also about focusing on the humans. It's about the real people you want to positively impact. It's about the users you want to interview, understand, and learn from. In your case, a married woman in China, African textile vendors in New York, disconnected youth chefs, and moms. It's about co-designing and prototyping often with your users. It's about the many stakeholders inside the ecosystem you're going to intervene on, and it's about the relationships and partnerships you need to build to make sure your interventions can scale and be sustainable in the future. Lang, Mayu, Phoenix, Zonliang, and Amanda. You were extremely focused and resilient and accomplished all of that. You struggled at times, of course. You received insights that challenged your assumptions. You laughed, you cried, you pivoted, in which case sometimes I cried. <laughs> you ideated, you prototyped, and tested. And throughout all the ups and downs, you persevered. Because real impact doesn't happen overnight. Projects worth pursuing take a really long time and a lot of effort, which is why you, whatever you have learned and what you're going to do is much more valuable. You know it is not for the faint of heart, which is why you took it on. Lang, you took on bringing together single professional women in China in order to fight stigma and unify their voices and took on the extra challenge of working with a community abroad. Yet, you managed to do so so well that you were censored. Now, that's impressive. <laughs> Mayu, your love and passion for traditional African crafts was infectious, and you made it your personal mission to find ways to communicate the hidden stories behind African textiles to foster respect for other cultures in such a fragmented world. Phoenix and Zoliang, you have fed me delicious kefir water and tasty fruit leather made from rescued fruit throughout the semester. How lucky am I? You identified youth chefs in training as a great opportunity to affect change and get us one step closer to zero waste kitchens. Amanda, your bookmaking workshop for moms aimed at facilitating conversations about sexual health and positive body image between mothers and daughters was not only incredibly fun, but also inspired me to have conversations with my own children that I never thought possible, so thank you. Through this process, you have learned so many valuable lessons, which you're going to carry with you as designers wherever you'll go. And you have taught me more than you'll never know, so thank you all. I'm extremely sad our class time has ended, but I do look forward to collaborating with you all out in the wild very, very, very soon. Now, tell us your stories. I'm Lang. Welcome to Flying Solo Salon. I'm building support for leftover women in China. For all of the fresh graduates in this auditorium, imagine what your life could be in the future. Now you have a master's degree. You will begin to work in a big city like New York. And not very long, you will develop a promising career and achieve financial independence. When you turn to 27 years old, if you are still single, you will have more possibilities to pursue your dream and explore new things. I believe nobody doubts this is a decent life for all modern people. But if you were a Chinese woman, most likely you would be called leftover women. 
Your parents, friends, colleagues would compare you to leftovers, which arouse feelings of not fresh, messy, devalued, and implies that nobody wants you, only because you are unmarried. In Beijing alone, there are over half a million single women are classified as leftover women. In China, over five million of single women are living under the pressure, which makes them feel anxious about their age and identity. Like one of my friends said, this society only acknowledges one way for women to achieve happiness, which is getting married. No matter how well I do my work, once I'm not married and don't have kids, I'm a loser in the view. Leftover women is just an event of the big issue of gender inequality in China. Chinese society is a typical patriarchal system. The mainstream has traditional stereotypes for women's role in family and society, which is bring house, doing housework, serving husband, and bringing up children. To the modern Chinese women who cannot fit in the stereotypes are confronting stigmatization. Leftover women is one of the popular stigmas and undermines a large number of women's well-being. I feel strong empathy with those women, so I wanted to know what I can do for them. I interviewed 25 so-called leftover women from six cities in China. They are in age from 27 to 40. They are lawyer, architect, teacher, manager, editor, researcher, doctor, student from all works of life. And uh, I found they have common struggles. They are devalued by their parents and relatives who urge them to marry. Like Xiao Yu said, her parents told her if she doesn't get married before 30, she will be discounted. And people around her always say she's too picky. Mandy wanted to apply for a PhD program, but her family members strongly opposed her because they thought it would be too hard for her to get married if she have a higher education level than the most of men. Hua Yi said she's afraid of being excluded by the mainstream society and lose connections with others. She doesn't think single women are connected. They are isolated individuals. The interviews led me to the four key insights. The first is, in fact, most of the leftover women are single professional women who are doing their work and life very well. Although society devalues them, they value themselves. The second is, they want to marry, but they are not willing to compromise. However, they don't have the bargaining power to negotiate with the mainstream who only sees women as servers, which means they have a clear goal that they want to have the value acknowledged by society. For achieving that goal, there is a precondition. They need a community to unite together. Currently, leftover women are isolated from each other. Although some of them strive to enter the mainstream, it doesn't work because each individual's effort is too weak to change the bias of society. But there is a big barrier prevents them from becoming community, which is the stigma of leftover women. With that stigma, they are afraid of being siloed as losers. Hence, they can only try to get out from leftover women group. So how might I take the initiative to unite those women together and help them to overcome the barrier of stigma so as to build a community to meet their need? In my hypothesis, as a start point, I would try to connect the women around me. We would form a small but high quality group as a foundation of the community. Then we would rise, raise a positive voice to the public. This voice would attract more target audiences to this group so the community could go. In my vision, the community will be included in the mainstream society, all the community members will be safe and achieve equal rights in family and society. So I'm building the identity and the community for single professional women in China to unite and challenge the stigma of leftover women in public. 
How did I do this? In the first place, I needed to understand them. I found that single professional women have good professional skills and resources, and they care much about social networking, as well as economic ability and self-development. In terms of target audiences' characteristics, I adopted a three-step approach to build the community. Connect, share, and voice. Instead of creating, instead of creating a new platform for the community, it's easier for my audiences to access to a pl platform which they already using every day. For Chinese, WeChat and Weibo are the most popular social media, so I used them to reach out to target audiences. For an initial prototype, I organized a WeChat group and did online sharing with my audiences. Since I understood that most of my audiences had a communication difficulty with their family members, so I shared my knowledge of nonviolent communication to improve the relationships. After I went back to China, I hosted a whole day event, local event called Flying Solo Salon, and I planned the agenda with my audiences. On that day, 37 people came. Everyone introduced themselves in turn. They shared the experience of being labeled as leftover women. Many spontaneous interactions happened, and they saw potential opportunities to benefit each other through connecting. I represented my project to them, and we had a group discussion about how to become community. One of the women said she appreciated that I brought them together and gave them a safe space to talk about the issue. She was bothered very much, but didn't know how to change. Now she feels she can be part of it. We also had two guest speakers. One of them is a global traveler. The other one is a young entrepreneur. They told the amazing stories and empowered others to believe that they can also live the life they want. This event activated the positive part of the identity through connecting and sharing. I reframed the identity from leftover to flying solo and shifted the image from negative, passive, and laggard to positive, proactive, and progressive. Then, in order to bring the impact to public and to consolidate the community, it's important to form a cohesive narrative for internal and external communication. I collected all the stories from my audiences and wrote an article, article to discuss the issue of leftover women. I published the article on different media platforms on the eve of Chinese New Year, which is the peak time of forced marriages happening. All of my audiences joined, and we launched the campaign together to promote a social movement which aimed to challenge the public's bias and eliminate the stigma. The most successful one happened on Weibo. We used the hashtag no forced marriages new year, and the campaign engaged thousands of users. They shared and discussed the issue very lively. Within three weeks, the post achieved over 1 million views, and the article had over 450,000 readings. I received tons of comments. Someone said this article blew their mind and changed their perception about those women. Someone said it spoke to them and resonated with them very much. And someone shared the article with their parents and friends and brought up conversations they craved for a long time. Most importantly, our voice weakened up more women. They realized how important their women can connect and support each other and refuse to be accomplice of the patriarchy system which oppresses us. During the process of campaign, we continuously developed the WeChat group. Within one month, we accumulated 104 core members. And on Weibo, we also achieved 1,706 followers. And one of the community members designed a logo for us. Flying Solo is a new identity 
for those women who deserve a good reputation for the courage to break stereotypes and lead the way for Chinese women. However, unfortunately, since our social campaign, social media campaign attracted too much attention on March 8th, the International Women's Day, our account on Weibo got censored by the authority. That was a big blow to us. We lost about 2,000 followers. We lost all the contents and the most important platform to voice. It reminded me that an anonymous user said, at the beginning, you thought you were resisting your parents. At the last, you will realize that you were resisting the country. In order to sustain the community safely, I try to navigate in local context, which means keeping away from politics. Hence, we didn't continue with the public campaign, but tend to develop an online sharing program in which we are still spreading word to more people. So how are those women now? In the community, they found the, the way to grow. They collaborated with each other. Luo Si and Feng, two young entrepreneurs, collaborated with Qing Qing to promote the company on her platform of Startup Grant. They supported each other. Ya Feng started a business in healthcare, and Zheng Qia, an expert in high tech medical industry, provided her lots of suggestions. And they brought new blood to the community. Xue Ying came to Chengdu to attend the TEDx talk as a speaker. She introduced new friends she met in TEDx to join the community. One of them told me I was anxious to get married because I was so afraid of struggling alone. But now I'm relieved seeing many people accompany me to work through the dark night together. We are flying solo, but we are not alone. Thank you and celebrate your accomplishments, girls. Hi, I'm Mayu. Thank you, everybody, who is here, and also who are watching me from back home or any other country. My project, H. Woven, Weaving Hearts, Hands, and Humans. H stands for Hearts, Hands, and Humans. People treat us like garbage. This is a quote from a vendor named Aisha an African-born immigrant who sells African print fabrics and clothes in Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Market in New York. What does this quote really mean? There are many factors. The consistent discrimination of black people and the current immigrant policies in the United States. But the biggest issue is that they are not totally humanized in this society. The reason why Aisha feels in this way is because the society doesn't validate her cultural values. Through Aisha's story, I understood that there is an unintended disconnection. What does this mean? According to the World Economic Forum in Davos, the world is fractured into small communities. Globalization is a rapid increase in cross-border economic, social, technological exchange under the conditions of capitalism. However, the community is still not connected globally. Today, I am going to talk to you about how we can alleviate this unintended disconnection by using the story of traditional textiles and overcome otherness. The African-born immigrant population has grown significantly in the United States over the past 40 years. 
This growth is 26 times more than in 1970. However, we only know very little about them. Before coming to New York, I worked in West Africa for several years. I lived there and made a lot of friends. And I grew my love for their traditional cultural products, especially hand-woven textiles made by local people. And through these experiences, I got interested to learn about the African-born immigrant community in the United States. To understand the situation of African-born immigrants in this city, I went to Harlem, a place that attracts the community. On my visit there, I observed many vendors selling traditional African textiles, which is the source of income among those immigrants. With my interest in the field, I focused on understanding these vendors. Through the course of one year, I spoke with a total of 42 people in Harlem to understand the situation. Through research, I observed that traditional craft vendors and their customers are not having meaningful conversations about the product, and the transactions are very dry. If this situation continued, customers will lose an important opportunity to learn a lesser known culture that can cause an unintended disconnection in society. To test this assumption, I conducted an in-depth research, and I found that most of African-born immigrants sell their traditional crafts without adding any value, despite these products have interesting cultural meanings and hidden stories rooted in their tradition. They have stories to tell, but why don't they tell them? While in Harlem, I also observed the customer interaction. They are actually interested in stories, but they often don't take an initiative to ask and learn these stories. Why don't they ask? Through my conversation with them, I learned from the vendor's perspective that they don't have means to communicate the stories well. And they assume that customers are not interested in the stories about the product. And from the customer side, they feel that there are no interesting stories. So they don't ask. And sometimes they feel reluctant to ask vendors, even if they want to know about it. So because of no interaction between customers and vendors, there is an unintended disconnection. And this unintended disconnection is negatively contributing to the underrepresentation of African culture in the society. My project challenges this status quo. When I spoke to one of the users, Moktao, he expressed the interest of having meaningful communication with customers. Based on the conversation with Moktao, I built a couple of tangible storytelling tools that facilitates vendors to have meaningful conversation with customers about their culture. I believe that such tools are the starting point to alleviate an unintended disconnection in society. My users are people like Mokta and them, and their customers who are creators and designers interested in African textiles. So I co-designed storytelling tools with Mokta by ideating and discussing what types of tools are appropriate for him and he is in his space. To understand and challenge customers' behavior at the moment of the purchase, I did a bunch of prototypes inside and outside of my user space, as you can see here. And I learned that customers' interest on stories depends on the product they are looking for. 
A customer looking for African traditional textiles is more interested in learning about cultural stories than a customer looking for African traditional crafts. And the biggest learning was when the tools required extra action for vendor or customer, they do not interact. So I went back to the shop space to understand customer and vendor's journey and see what could be the point of intervention in the journey. As you can observe through the journey of both customer and vendor in the shop, the point of intersection between the journeys is packaging. And at the moment of the packaging, a customer waits while a vendor is preparing to hand the textile to her or him. Based on the user journey, I discussed with the vendor and created this storytelling package so that while the vendor is cutting textiles, a customer can take a look at it and learn about cultural stories. I user tested this storytelling package around Brooklyn Museum and Starbucks. And I met this lady who said, this package inspires me to share my own story, an Afro-Haitian one and history of my own. And I realized how successfully this prototype created a strong interest in interaction from a potential customer. And I also tried this one with another vendor. This tool is called the storytelling tag, designed for a vendor designer from Senegal selling hand-woven traditional textiles in Malcolm Shabazz Harlem Market. His name is Dan. And he's passionate about telling indigenous stories. The booth in this marketplace is really small, so his space is tightly packed, and there's no space to put anything. There's not even enough space to stand. So I tried to come up with a tool that fits his needs of storytelling in a cramped space. This is how this tool looked like while in the space. And I successfully got customers to interact with this tool. And my user Dam loved it and reported to me that he had a bunch of meaningful conversation with his customers. And he even said this increased the sales within two weeks. My intervention is scalable because the artisan sector is the second largest employer in the developing world after agriculture. It is worth over 32 billion every year. And every vendor and creator of traditional products who are not currently telling stories can benefit from the tool. And there are thousands of artisans making traditional products in local communities. It means there are a lot of stories to be told. So I'm going to seek out more vendors and more businesses who are eager to tell hidden stories to scale up. In terms of next steps, it will be amazing to develop an app that creates these storytelling tags easily. When this app is created and launched, my current users who are African-born immigrant vendors will be able to use this app to take pictures or use local photos, type the stories directly that they want to tell. And this app will automatically create this kind of tag that can be exported to a JPEG, and then they will be able to print out these by themselves to create their own tags. For now, I secured the collaboration with an Airbnb African Culture Tour Guide in Harlem, led by Bomi Davis. She told me she would love to use my storytelling package in her tour. When you don't know the culture of the people, you can't respect those people. When you know, you can respect them. I expect 
my project will get more people to respect lesser known or underrepresented cultures. And I expect that there will be less unintended disconnection in the society. And in the near future, I would love to hear Aisha saying, people respect us as Malian by weaving herds, hands, and humans. Thank you. Um, before I start, I want to ask you a question. How many of you have uh, here are scared of eating the dishes made by food waste? <laughs> all of you. <laughs> Almost all of you. <clears throat> okay. We won't serve the dishes today, so don't worry. <laughs> and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zongliang Xiang. My name is Phoenix, and Chinese name is Qian Shang Chen. This is who we are. We love food, we love to cook, and we love to share our food with our friends. One day, we were shopping in green markets, and we saw this apple in the compost bin. It's still fresh, colorful, but it would be sent to compost. We were shocked, and we want to do something for that. Today, we want to tell you some facts about fruit. New York City restaurants generate close to a half million tons of food loss every year, enough to fill over 100 subway cars every day. Here, I want to clarify fruit waste and fruit loss. Fruit loss refers to all food produced for human consumption, but not eaten by humans. Fruit waste is a part of fruit loss. The reason why we chose fruit loss because of you guys. You are scared of the waste word when you are eating. And there are more than 45,000 restaurants in New York City. So imagine this will happen every day. In order to prove this is a fact, a snowing night, we went dumpster diving. The weather in New York City never helped us when we wanted to do something. It was so hard to search the dumpster covered with snow. But we still found these fruit in a trash bag in front of a restaurant. Every year, fruit wastage is about 25% in total amount of food loss. Fruit loss includes fresh and processed fruit, which means New York City restaurants waste 75,000 tons of fruit every year. And in, in restaurants, more fruit loss happened in kitchens. The rea reality about kitchens is that they care about speed and attractiveness. Those two things cause more fruit, fruit loss. This is, an, this is an example of how they treat apples. The damaged apple, they will throw away directly. And the fresh apple, one third of it will be thrown away after cutting. The chefs are the persons working in the kitchen. We need to get involved of a fruit loss from chef's level. We partner with Food Art Center, a commercial kitchen with a mission. They are dedicated to helping young adults with physical, developmental, or learning disabilities, and any young person disconnected from the support they need to move into a successful and self-sufficient adulthood through their culinary training program. In Food Art Center, we met this group of chefs. They are young adult chef between 18 to 26 years old. Coming to Food Art Center, they have some developmental challenges and they want to learn a new skill to support their lives. They take eight sessions of culinary classes to learn how to cook with professional chefs. Every day after class, when they clean the kitchen, they find so many fruit scraps. These students have a concern about waste of food. I feel bad about throwing away so many fruit and I don't know what I can do to rescue them. This is an opportunity to add the knowledge about reducing fruit loss to the chefs. After training, most of them want to have their own kitchen someday. 
which means they are going to be the chefs influencing the restaurants and cooking in the future. How do we teach them new ways to think about cooking that doesn't waste fruit? Before, the excess fruit would be composed. Now, we created new dishes to specifically teach people not to waste fruit, and we are making this a part of Young Adult Chef's culinary training program. Taking this bruised apple as an example, we collect this from the commercial kitchen. After we cut out the bruised part, we turn the pulp into the apple sauce, and the corn and peel become tea, nothing left. After we showed them our recipe and we cooked together, the young chef was exciting and they created new dishes by themselves. They took the skinless orange that they had left over from the previous event, then they smashed them to orange juice, used them as a replacement for milk to make this diary-free orange juice cupcake. The last example is the water kefir. The word kefir is true to have original from the Turkish word kefir, which loosely means good feeling. It's a probiotic beverage, is healthy and good for your stomach, like dairy-free yogurt. First fermentation made by water kefir grain in the sugar water solution and wait for three to four days. Then we use more part of leftover fruit for the second fermentation to improve the flavor and color. The beverage have many advantage. It's healthy, it helps the body with healing and maintain function and also contain easy digestible complete proteins. Customizable, you can use any kind of food to ferment. And also sustainable, only take two to three days to make and the water kefir green can duplicate itself. After we finished cooking with our young chef, we brought all the innovative dishes to our next event, the tasting event. Good food should be shared, as we said at the beginning. So we held this tasting and educational event. We gather a group of people who are interested in food and food loss issue. We gave them a lecture about our topic, story, and how to cook those dishes. And we have an intensive conversation around food waste issue. Then we gave them a dishes for feedback and share our recipe with them, so they can reduce their food waste in their own kitchen. One food taster told us, this cupcake with apple sauce is so yummy, but if you can make it both dairy-free and gutter-free, that will be perfect. That will be our next step. We also hear back from our chef, the taste is so good that I cannot believe we use food scrap to make it. I'm going to tell my friends and family. So we are not only affect our chef's behavior, but also their family and friends. So far, here is what we accomplished. 14, food taster experiment with rescue food recipes, 10 pounds of food rescue, six young adult chefs changed to become more socially responsible with zero lost kitchen skills, and five innovative dishes that we create. We believe this model can evolve. So how do we scale up? This leads us to launch this project, WeBite. WeBite contains two sections, Instagram and the WeBite's couple. Online section on Instagram, we create a hashtag called WeBite. So it's buy it again. We took a nice picture of our dishes from our workshop. Then we share the recipe and chef story to get more followers to our community. We call them WeBite community. But it was hard to get followers at the beginning, so we went offline to hold a public activity. We did dumpster diving again, and this time it wasn't snowing, but it's rainy and it's windy. <laughs> so as usual, we collect food scrap as much as we can, such as purple onion peel, orange peel, and beet peel, which we normally store away. Then we turn them into the food color pigment and paint in public. Many people join our activity, after they learn more about our story, they start to follow our Instagram too. At the end, we create a hashtag thread for our WeBite community, and this is also the start point for our WeBite project. In terms of the cookbook, we use as a guide to list other culinary schools to hold a similar workshop and event in order to produce more socially responsible chefs. This cookbook can take recipe and workshop flow, so others can follow our instructions to become zero lost kitchens too. So our next step, more workshop to reducing food waste, which will create more innovative dishes and expanding our model to more culinary schools. More young chefs with socially responsible mindset, so they will bring their zero waste learning to influence other kitchens. Imagine 45,000 kitchens in New York City if they all have our We Buy Chefs. More follower, 
we will keep expanding our WePite community and eventually become a WePite movement to find food ways together. And we want to bring our water keeper to move forward. If you are interested in it, feel free to contact us. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Not, yeah, okay. All right, so we're going to try something. Uh, I'm going to come over here. I'm <laughs> uh, <laughs> going to take my one TED Talk chance. Uh, <laughs> this is my TED Talk. Um, I am Amanda Finuccio, and I'm going to talk to you about moms who make books. Uh, this was made by a lot of moms, including mine, who's right over there. Uh, so my project's about sexual health education, but not so much this kind. A little bit more of this kind. Uh, and I chose sexual health because when I moved to New York City, I found myself in some feminist sex circles and we'd get into lots of conversations about shame and fear and guilt. And I started to think about where we even get our sexual health messages. Uh, so I wanted to explore the state of sexual health education today. So my <laughs> conversations with women conjured up this image. Uh, conversations were filled with highs and lows, uh, lots of confusion. And so a big part of this was where do we even get these messages? Why do they feel confusing? What feels high? What feels low? So my initial research took me to this insight that most sexual health education organizations are pushing for earlier education and more frequent education. And why? When adolescents were asked for feedback, they said, guys, get this, get this ball rolling a little sooner and we might be okay. So with that in mind, I checked out these four environments where sexual health education takes place. When it comes to school, most education is provided between the ages of 11 and 18. That's a combination of middle school and high school. And according to the CDC, middle school education is about annually three hours and high school education is about annually four hours. But this is the trick. Sex education is only required in 24 states in the United States. And then there's a few more variables that stack up there. Your district, your school, your instructor. So when it comes to the internet, huh, the internet, by 13 to 17, 73% uh, of adolescents have a cell phone. And as one of the moms I worked with like to put it, that means they have access to everything from puppies to porn in under three seconds. And when it comes to pediatricians, Appointments take place annually, and they use those opportunities to have uh, milestone conversations. For example, at six, they focus on good touch, bad touch. At nine, puberty. And at 13, they start to talk about contraception and STDs. That said, most conversations are reported to last less than 40 seconds. So a whole lot's not happening. And when it comes to parents, every family is totally different, but most parents said that they use puberty and menstruation as the start of more substantial conversations. So there's a little bit of a gap in how we get there. So when I looked at the entire landscape, most education was focusing on preteen and teenage years, which then led me to think, okay, so how do we get to the years that lead up to that? So I wanted to know now who has the most influence in this space, who are children listening to the most? It's their parents, no, no shocker here. Uh, and so I wanted to know why, why are parents so important? Um, and the messages and the values that they create in their space that is the home have a lasting impact on their behaviors and their decisions. Plus, they get to interact with their kids all the time. So kids are mimicking behavior. They're listening to lots of things. They're giant sponges. And so within parents, I wanted to focus on moms. I had a personal interest in women, um, but most sexual health educators within the family were identified to be moms. Dads, step it up. We'll talk about that later. Um, and so from here, uh, I worked with 12 moms across two cities. Uh, Miami is my hometown, and so we had a few mom connections there. And then here in New York City, where I partnered with two organizations um, on getting moms to uh, get interested in talking to me. And so when I started my research, there was just this very human, loving connection to want to be close to their children. They wanted to raise good humans. They, wanted to, they want their kids to know they can talk to them, see them as sources of information, especially when you consider the internet absolutely terrifying. 
And that kind of led them to this place of, I want to be the person who's talking, but I don't know what to say, and I don't know when to say it, and I'm constantly level setting, and I'm pretty sure I said the wrong thing, so what do I do? This fear leads to a lot of reaction versus preparation. Mom's kind of freaking out of, I told her an answer, I'm not really sure that was the right answer, and now I need to go backtrack in five years and tell her I kind of lied. Um, so that came up and happened a lot. So I asked myself this question of, could we create a supportive space where moms could explore the values and messages that they wanted to share so they could prepare for the conversations they wanted to have that would build them to these strong relationships that they really wanted? And so my next question for them was, where do you get information? Because moms were also sometimes using the internet, but more than that, they were reaching out to other women, to other parents, and they were reading a lot of books. So I wanted to know, okay, cool, you read books. What do your kids do? What do you want your kids to be doing? They also want their kids to be reading books. And so at this point, moms want books, kids want books, everyone's on board. I love books. So I created these two, these two sets of criteria. This is for moms, and this is for daughters. Imaginative, tech-free, age-appropriate. We're gonna utilize the knowledge of women, and we're gonna use that to build relationships with kids. And so from here, Moms Makes Books is born, and for about four months, I got to make books with a lot of cool women uh, who I think are total rock stars. And essentially, it's a bookmaking workshop where moms get together because they want sexual health education to start at home. So it works a little bit like this. We choose an age-appropriate topic based on the ages of mom's children. So because our age range is four to 12, it definitely operated within that space. And we got the village together, then they wrote about the messages they wanted to share. We'll get into that process. And then they drew to visualize those messages, and they combined them into books. And I did this over four months in, across two different cities, and we did it four times. So the village is a complete and total force. You get moms in a room. They're gabbing. They're sharing stories. They're finding commonality. They're seeking advice from each other. They really enjoyed that some moms had children who were older because it kind of gave them like an insight into the future. So they were like, thank you, I need to hear this. I don't want to talk about this. I'm going to go home and do that now. And then when it came to writing, after moms had already connected, one of the things that they shared with me was, I'm dying to improve my personal experience growing up. My parents didn't tell me anything. That cannot be me. I don't want to be that parent. So writing, I took an approach from a writer and cartoonist, Linda Berry. She for all of her workshops, has people write from memory as a source of creativity. So we did something like this. You'd start with the topic, for example, body image, then you would create a list of the first 10 images that come to mind. Then you choose one that conjures up a vivid memory or a vivid message that you received as a child, and then we write about it for about eight to 10 minutes. And then from there, moms would share, laughter ensued, lots of fun things ensued and they would synthesize that message into about two to three sentences that would serve as the content for the book. This didn't always work. Some moms, not stoked about revisiting their past, weren't very crazy about the fact that memory was the source of content, and so when that happened, we improvised a little bit, and we started with group conversation. I harvested some topics, and then from those topics, they chose one, followed the same writing structure, and got a message that reflected more present-day conversations. Drawing. Drawing is intimidating. I learned this by trying to draw with friends. I quickly learned that drawing is less intimidating if you do it with other people. So this was one of the first things we tried just to kind of get their hands moving. Many people claimed that they had not held a crayon in years. And so we tried this exercise, which is called the Jam Book, which I got from a professor who has a background in creative writing and comics. Crazy fun. So you start with eight panels. Moms would break up their message across these eight panels. They illustrate the first panel, and then every minute, for eight minutes, they rotate until all the moms in the room have contributed to their story. And what's great about this is, if you're not really sure how to make abstract and literal images, you get ideas from other moms. And what was even great is that moms ended up using some other mom's ideas. Come book making was like, could you make this for me? Because I want it in my book, but I'm not gonna do it. So that was pretty exciting. So these are books. Moms made some killer books. Uh, this workshop focused on body image. And here moms explored what it means to feel good enough, what is good enough even. How do you take care of yourself? How do you understand that you're unique, that you're special, that you're beautiful? 
At this other workshop, they focused on consent and boundaries. How do you understand that your body is yours? How do you take control of it? Uh, how do you tell people no? How do you say yes? They wanted to focus on diversity. I want to teach my kid that bodies look different, that it's OK to look different. I want them to know that theirs is exceptional. And I wanted to use, so now you see that the collaborative drawing then translated into this. And she had exceptional drawing skills, so she was definitely a front runner in this game. <laughs> and two of the workshops included childcare. Childcare is kind of like a magic sauce in this entire process. Um, it allows moms to bring the kids there and come time to make. It served as a really great opportunity to just initiate conversation in the moment so daughters could draw with their moms, create stories with their moms, and it gave me the opportunity to see what that interaction looks like. One story from Benny. Uh, who I was fortunate enough to have her come to one of my workshops. Uh, she made this wonderful book for her daughter um, about feeling beautiful always and representing yourself as you want to be represented and having control of your body. And killed it, killed it with construction paper. And her daughter was there, and so when she shared the book with Una, Una made her own book with all the confetti. Uh, and I'm going to read it out loud. Uh, you were part of the ocean, you were sparkly, you were golden, you were beautiful, you were you. Another mom who came to a workshop but whose child wasn't present uh, made a book as well, and when she got home and shared it with her daughter, she made this art piece as a response to that, melting, so much melting. Um, and overall, in the experience, moms had some really just warm <laughs> feedback for me, which was, uh, Georgiana said, I never have this time for myself, I never make with my other parts of my brain, and I'm always strategizing with my child, so it's just complicated to figure out your thoughts in the moment. Michelle just immediately saw the value of the book. Uh, there was a little bit of a, a struggle in the beginning, but we got there, and she was really excited to use it as a conversation point for her child, and she felt really motivated to continue making more stories with her daughter. And Natalia, saw this as a complete and total reflection space. She, you know, in one of our circles was just like, you know, I think about these things, but I don't think I've ever explicitly told my daughter, like, this is how I think you should think about your body. This is how I think about my body. And I didn't notice that until I was deep into my 30s and was like, I need to give her these life hacks. Like, she will suffer, but maybe I could help her suffer a little less. And so as I think about next steps, I'm pretty excited about the space that this was able to create for moms. Uh, and I do think that it's something I'd like to continue. And my heart completely and totally melted when I heard one mom say to the other, I want to buy your book. So from here, the vision totally exploded for me. And I just kept thinking about what an entire platform of mom-authored content would look like. And then back to dads, what would it look like to involve fathers in the mix? And then what would it look like to get families making books? Could we have daughters and moms collaborating, daughters and dads collaborating? Could the whole family just be making books, creating their own stories? So books made by families to create and strengthen conversation and relationships at home. So I'd like to partner with more parent-child education spaces, like the Brooklyn Public Library, Planned Parenthood, Girl Scouts of America, um, and I'd like to keep it going. But before I do that, I have so many people to thank. Um, first and foremost, to all the moms who participated in this with me, uh, your willingness to share your stories, your hopes and dreams was my education, uh, and I'm super grateful for that. Uh, to my mom and to my dad, who've been <laughs> patient. Um, and uh, to Cheryl Heller for even starting this program so I could even stand on this stage. To Benny for her offering her time in times that she didn't necessarily need to. To my cohort for listening to the first years, for asking questions. Uh, and to my single moms, Andrea and Gerilyn Powell. Uh, they've been my complete and total family throughout this process. So go make books, talk about sex, love your children. Thank you. Cheryl said to call this to order, so let's call it to order. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to my first concert, uh, my band's first concert. My name is Jeff. Uh, I want to thank you to Cheryl and the rest of the core four, and of course, my amazing group of students this year, Yuka, Sandy, Alejandro, Lee Rong, and Jin Wei. 
Uh, I think we can all agree that inside and outside of DSI, this has been a very long year, and for many reasons, Trump being the main one. And I feel like on a day like today, uh, all of your achievements deserve a little bit of a celebration. Uh, to my group, you were a pretty chill one, and my anxiety greatly appreciates that. But even more importantly, your projects benefited from your calm approach to some really difficult issues. People who stutter, limited English proficient populations, which that really tests your English proficient that phrase, and uh, nursing home residents have been positively impacted by your work. So you should all be really proud of what you accomplished, both for yourselves and for the people around you that you were affected. This is beautiful music, right? I'm, and I also just want to say that I think we'll always be living in a time when smart people like these are needed to solve the problems they see. So times like right now only magnify that need. But it's really important for programs like DSI because they're essential in creating the warriors that are going to fulfill that need in this world. So today, I just want to celebrate those warriors and that will eventually make our future so much better. Am I? Just another Joseph in love with the past Scraping with the rats under the bowery Waiting for someone to give a damn I'm trying to keep my love above the money Wake up and fight for your mighty little life goes by The brutal bellows below stoke a fire And it is lawless Wake up and fight no more And then nostalgia Colors from our time only on the canvas Colors from our time are you somebody's savior? Are you somebody's plan? Feasts or famine, we're all coming hungry. Nary a man can boast clean hands. You know you mock our love by trying. up and fight for your mighty little life goes by all the brutal bellows below stoke a fire and it is lawless wake up and fight no more under nostalgia colors from our time only on the canvas colors 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 our time only on Alex Sean, I hope, everybody, I hope everybody's feeling a little bit less nervous now and, and now the projects. Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Ayuka. Uh, when I was nine, I started stuttering. So I've suffered for many years with stuttering. For me, uh, it leads to such extremely strong feeling of inadequacy that I couldn't even ask my parents uh, or friends for help. Uh, and for a long time, so I would fail into a circle of uh, blaming myself every time so I mess up uh, or fail and, uh, because of stuttering. Not wanting to be seen stuttering, so I stopped participating in my friend's conversation. If I was going to be embarrassed, then it would be better to uh, give up and not uh, try from the start. It was that a kind of negative childhood, so I worked to hide it. And I uh, tried never to stutter in front of the people. Stuttering made me lonely. 
The reason I, I became fearful of communication will become clear when you watch the video shown after this. Unaware that he is stuttering. He innocently talks with his friends and speaks up in class. He is unable to speak fluidly and is teased by his classmates. He loses self-esteem. So he practices speaking in front of other people. In the hope that the stuttering will soon be gone. However, his stutter still doesn't get better. It is said that stuttering uh, is incurable by uh, present medical treatments. So many people suffering from a stutter in childhood and then faced with the fact that they cannot speak the same as other children uh, and, and that uh, it does not get any better and uh, become despondent. The impact is so huge. So 1% of, uh, of total population are stutterers uh, and it is said that there are over 70 million people around the world who stutter. He is the Daniel. He felt a burden by incredible uh, troubles uh, and anxiety after graduating college. He is worried that his stuttering would uh, prevent him from getting a job. He spoke of the powerful anxiety he felt uh, during interviews uh, and how he would get rejected every time. He was worried by the uh, double pressure of having to conduct himself well at the interview, as well as having to uh, pass the interview itself. As he interviewed more and more, he realized something. In an interview, no matter how much he wanted to hide his stuttering, he couldn't stop himself. I'm failing my interview because I cannot stop from stuttering. So uh, that's how he saw the reason for his failure. Whenever he was re uh, rejected by the job uh, prospect, he uh, blamed himself for stuttering. Uh, there is a standard pattern whereby they uh, try to hide their stuttering, uh, like a Daniel. So uh, they disappear at the fact that it cannot be changed and uh, becoming uh, convinced that stuttering uh, is something to be embarrassed by. Uh, and so, and practice uh, techniques to hide it. So uh, this is done together with the school counselor during senior high school uh, and college. So uh, I began by uh, trying to see things from the perspective uh, of CEO. Asking him to tell me the reason he decided to hire each person. He said, uh, whether or not you stutter, extremely uh, important to be uh, to be honest about your weaknesses uh, and speak and act with the confidence. So people like that uh, make an impression. The people who were receiving a therapy from a school counselor uh, before graduation saw the support evaporate as soon as they left the school. So uh, post a graduation, uh, uh, they headed out to job interview and to be judged by society. After that, as their sense of the urgency uh, grows, and they uh, decide they want to begin seriously uh, treating their stuttering uh, and start seeing a, a, a private therapy. And then uh, they finally uh, become able to endeavor to accept uh, themselves as starters, and they uh, become able to work towards uh, making this stuttering often. So uh, what is necessary to get through the job interview? To find the answer to that question, I conducted an uh, interview uh, of people who had successfully interviewed for the job. As a result, I realized the importance of openly talking about your stuttering in order to use it in creating a, a positive impression. In other words, stuttering is an extremely effective tool for the creation of stories that uh, give a positive impression. I got insight from Jir. She practiced the interview a lot in safe space. So I came up with an idea that I create a safe space where they could fail as much as they want, where we have lowered the hurdles to failure, a space where no matter how many times they fail, 
and they won't be a blame or judge. A place that will uh, let them get used to failing and, and uh, possibly to chip away at the negative values they associated with the failure. And with that, I came up uh, with the idea uh, of uh, creating a virtual space that uh, would allow them to practice interview as much as they wanted. By using this uh, VR technology, starters can start uh, without restriction, failing as many times as they need to. And uh, by getting accustomed to experience of failure uh, and accumulating more and more experience of success, uh, in the end, uh, they will be able to uh, build self-confidence. Additionally, uh, there is a famous framework for developing self-confidence called the step-by-step -step approach. Its concept involves moving gradually from an easy level to um, a difficult level, allowing the individual to conquer uh, their fear and instill confidence uh, in themselves. My product uh, is developed uh, based on uh, this step-by-step -step framework. Uh, here is how it works. First, uh, create a story that uh, gives a positive impression. Improve the quality uh, of the story through interaction with other people, uh, and then use it uh, during interview practice in the virtual space. All of this resulted uh, in the final outcome, my uh, creation of Burble. So Barbo uh, is a product that uh, combines online platform with the VR to allow people to use uh, their stories to practice and uh, job interviews. Uh, uh, please watch them video. Barbo focuses on the intersection between artificial intelligence and virtual reality. By merging these two technologies, we hope to give individuals with social anxiety the opportunity to prepare for specific social events at their own pace. We believe in the power of artificial intelligence to shape the future of virtual reality training and therapy by making it the guiding force for creating dynamic, immersive experiences. Hi, I'm Vrabal, your virtual therapy assistant. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. What is Through the application of a voice assistant, Verbal is able to determine how the user wants to practice relaxation techniques, what events they want to practice for, and what their current anxiety level is. Based on this information, the voice assistant is able to personalize environments and simulations and gradually expose the user to their social fear. And take a big breath. So hey everyone, um, my name is, Ad is Ad Dan Mallon. Um, I'll load the next simulation soon. Before we move on, how anxious are you feeling right now on a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being calm? And ten being extremely anxious. Uh, one. Uh, my name is uh, I, I, Dan Mallon. Um, I'm from uh, St Staten Island. Um, I'm a recent uh, graduate from a uh, college of Staten Island. With so uh, here is some feedback from uh, Daniel. He say uh, this product could help people deal with anxieties as well as learn new things about how they handle certain interview environments. And here is feedback from Sun. He said, it was a good overall experience. As a result, a page view of website uh, is over uh, 20,000. 80% of testers say so th uh, they want to keep using it. Uh, Daniel was successfully able to get a job. He says that because of his experience with Bubble, he has been able to change the way he looks at his stuttering. Uh, and that uh, because of the repeated practice, he was able to open up and uh, present the interviewer with the story uh, of himself as a stutterer. 
So now that we can see the BR is helping people who stutter, it should be accessible to those in need. Here are components uh, of system. On the online platform, so user can freely upload their story. So user can share it with other friends and through that interaction design a story that's unique to them as a starter. And uh, this is what it uh, looks like. And also, in order to connect the two different platforms of the VR and the website, a web VR was created. It's possible to view it in your browser uh, or to download a VR headset uh, and view it that way. And uh, this is what it looks like. So people can read the stories. To scale the impact, I got an open space uh, in Brooklyn uh, called the uh, VR bar. Where for only $28, people can use VR for as much as they would like. So I have received permission from the owner to receive developed a VR application uh, and an online platform. Moreover, I will have a workshop with the Bobo for real experiences repeatedly. So participants should look at the posture and check the dates for workshop. But so you will be able to participate in the practice interview in VR. In order to make the product verbal more sustainable, I am working on making a more concrete business plan. So with the current model, the next closest step would be to sell the application as a, a downloadable app on place, such as the Oculus App Store. So I also intend to develop a learning program aimed at children who suffer from stuttering. So because experiencing a trauma like I did and continuing to suffer in adulthood is something I absolutely don't want to for the next generation of children. And so I believe that Bobo can give more people all over the world the confidence to enter society and challenge themselves with new possibilities. So disabilities are to the people who have them extremely negative things. However, when someone changes this negative feeling into a positive, so they can begin to truly build their self-esteem. It is my hope that a top continually challenge ourselves and raising that true sense of self-esteem. So in the end, the very feeling of being disabled itself will be a transform uh, and I can achieve a society where uh, each individual person can feel genuinely uh, glad to have been born just the way they were. So happily, uh, uh, Bobo has selected as a finalist for the Microsoft uh, Imaging Cup. So I will keep working on this project as a social innovator. So I still remember when I came to DSI first time, so I was so nervous, so I stuttered, and also I'm not an, a native English speaker. But uh, now I'm here, so I can build my self-confidence through my thesis project. So thank you for uh, supporting me. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, me llamo Alejandro, and I grew up in a city with three official languages, English, Spanish, and French Creole. Ni hao. My name is Sandy, and I grew up in Singapore, a country with four official languages, English, Mandarin, Malay, and Tamil. And we are both avid polyglots, which means we both speak more than two languages. So we know it takes time to learn a new language. And we believe that no one should have to wait to be able to exert your rights. So let me ask, how many of you have ever applied for a driver's license, gotten a marriage certificate, applied for school? Sounds boring easy, and maybe, if anything, a bit tedious. But for 25 million Americans living in the US with limited English proficiency, or LEP for short, getting access to these basic services is nearly impossible. Government staff are often untrained in helping this population, underfunded to provide translations, and in some cases, unaware that they even offer these services. So let's meet Elsa. Elsa is one of those 25 million LEPs. When she first moved to the US from Colombia, she had to do something we all took for granted. She had to apply for a state ID. 
We underestimate the difficulty and importance of receiving these vital services when we place a language barrier in the way. For her, she said, it was embarrassing to go out and even do basic things. Getting her ID was a complete mess, and she remembers the staff pointing and raising their voice in frustration. She said, I felt helpless, and I didn't want to go back. And she's not alone. Even in cities and states with the most advanced language access plans, there are still gaps in varying levels of implement implementation across departments. And as you can see here on this graph, only a mere 25% of those LEPs got any sort of their uh, needs met when they went to the DMV. And so how does something as simple as a state ID potentially affect their life? Well, there's several ramifications. For example, limiting their ability to potentially find work or open a bank account, sign leases, or even be barred from entering their children's school, or yet worse, being stopped by the police if you don't have a valid ID to verify your identity in this political climate, the results could be disastrous. And these are all the ramifications of something just going wrong at the DMV. And that's to say that the DMV is a small part of a larger governmental system. So what happens when an LEP goes to a government office? They typically encounter staff who are not trained to interact with LEPs who may not be aware of the language services that their department offers, much less promote them. And this prevents LEPs from exerting their rights, leading to poor experiences at the office. The poor experiences discourages LEPs from showing up at government. This leads government to perceive a lack of need and creates a vicious cycle where needs are not met or supported. In states where language access is law, it is treated like a box that needs to be checked. The most common solution is the use of machine translations to improve accessibility. However, the government is not using it as intended by providers. They often put up boilerplate disclaimers, stating that they are unable to guarantee accuracy or be held accountable for poor or inaccurate translations, putting all the risks on vulnerable LEPs. By, providing, by not providing good language access, Government excludes LEPs from meaningfully participating in civic society and receiving vital services. So we wondered, how might we ensure that information about government is services is easily accessible regardless of language? Over the course of our thesis, we spoke to 22 different stakeholders and a couple themes began to emerge. First was a concern of agency and independence as LEPs felt that they couldn't do anything without the aid of an English speaker. Second was a sense of trust, as LEPs were worried about being scammed and wanted to ensure that the information they were receiving was accurate. And finally, and maybe most importantly, was a sense of accountability, as LEPs currently felt that even though there may be laws in place to protect them, that no one cares or actually follows through with them. So keeping all of this in mind, when we started thinking of a solution, we, decided we wanted to make sure that all of those concerns were addressed. And so we developed our initial prototypes. Our first prototype helps LEPs fill out their forms better. But we soon learned that they were more interested in speaking to people. Our second prototype addresses that. And we created Yelp for LEPs, amplifying their current support systems. And it turned out to be very successful. And so we arrived at our first feature, the language service directory. With this language service directory, an LEP will be able to check ahead of time the language services that an office offers and plan ahead. But we soon realized that wasn't enough, and so we thought of our second feature. So the next prototype, we put in um, the directory with community information, because we thought by showing community th ties, they would be more willing to use HeyPoly. However, they weren't interested. <laughs> And so we should decide to show more government information. But it proved to be very overwhelming. And finally, that led to our final prototype, a simple Q&A where they're able to easily ask questions and get answers. So introducing our final, Hey Polly, your rights and resources in your language. What's great about Hey Polly was that it was created using simple tools on Google, such as Google Sites and Google Docs, which means it's easy to maintain. It has a low tech barrier to entry for new community users, and it's scalable. And when I mean scalable, it's scalable across a different plethora of communities, being able to uh, 
reflect the specific community demographic and needs of said city. So how would someone, a user such as Elsa, go ahead and use this service? Well, let's say Elsa one day tiene una pregunta or she has a question. She would go ahead and access Hey Polly and access it, access it in her native language of Spanish. And if she had a question, she could go ahead and search our archives to see if that question has already been previously answered. And if not, she can go ahead and submit it directly to our site and make sure that she will get that, answer, that question answered by a verified community member or government staff. And if she plans on going to the department in person, she can go ahead and access the language service directory to see what sort of language access plans are in place so she can plan accordingly. But what if her question isn't answered and we can't answer it? So we decided to bring those questions back to government. To do that, we built out a monthly reporting system that will collect all unanswered questions, community concerns, and discrepancies in language access. And we plan on using this information to hold government accountable. We brought this back to Jersey City, the Office of Walking Communities, and we heard positive feedback. But the, the office was realistic about implementation timelines and just suggested that we sought out community groups. We were a bit discouraged, but just by showing up and advocating for language access, we were already able to shift mindsets. A government staff says, now, whenever he goes into a meeting, he always thinks about language access. So we thought, with the right tools and resources, anyone can advocate for language access. And so, Hey Polly became a two-part system, one for LEPs and another for community members that want to bring Hey Polly into their community. To allow for easy dissemination, we created a website, um, polyportal.com slash toolkit. And on the website, we share presentation materials, templates, that will allow any community member to learn more about language access, use our slides and resources to train other community members, set up their own community poly and reporting system, and using our letter templates, take action within government right, by writing letters to the elected officials. So to scale for, pro uh, for scalability, we brought our prototype back to New York City and tested in the New York Public Library English Conversation classes, where we had a plethora of LEP users to test with and librarians who thought that this would be really useful in the library system, as they're already one of the most trusted community members that LEPs turn to when they first arrive in this country. And from the LEPs themselves, they say it's a great resource of information, especially to those just arriving. And overwhelmingly, what we heard was everyone was surprised this was something that wasn't made available yet. So what Hey Polly does is increase a sense of agency so they can use it independently, increases a sense of trust so they can ask anonymously and make sure they're getting verified information. And maybe most importantly, it's run by the community for the community so it makes sure that government is held accountable. So when we first started our thesis, we saw a vicious cycle where needs are not met or supported. And we stepped in, and with Hey Polly, we'll make sure that language services are promoted and that LEPs are aware of their rights to access. With our reporting system, we'll make sure that government is aware of the needs within their communities. And with our toolkit, we provide government the tools to train their staff members to, equip, to make sure that those needs are met. So you might be wondering at this point, why Hey Polly? We all deserve a government that is held accountable and that and provides accurate information. When we first started our thesis, this is what language access looked like. A linear and one-sided form of communication that fragmented all the stakeholders. So previously, if Elsa was turned away at the DMV, she might have to wait months to try again, and her success would hinge on the ability to find a friend or family member who spoke English to go along with her and interpret. But now, Polly is a more fully realized communication system that fosters relationships between those previously disconnected stakeholders, which means that Elsa can now independently seek out government services and assert her rights. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we forgot. <laughs> One last thing, and this is brand new as of last week. So um, we're currently working with the Jersey City government to bring this into Jersey City. And we are also trying to work out something with the New York Public Library. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, I'm Jingwei. Hi, I'm Li Rong. This is little me in the grand in the arms of my grandmother. She is so strong and brave. She is always my safe place. This is a nursing home near my home. One day, my grandmother asked me to visit there with her to visit one of her friends. After we entered the nursing home, I immediately feel something wrong. Here it is extremely quiet. And we met her friends. This lady told us that she has saved two persons' lives during her stay in a nursing home. She saw the nursing aide abuse the seniors, and she reported to the safety guard. Then the workers moved them away. Did she really save them? I don't think so. After we left the nursing home, I could see the sadness on my grandmother's face. She told me, getting old is scary. Sweetheart, don't put me into a nursing home. It was heartbreaking to me. It was the first time I saw my grandmother so scared of something. And I questioned myself, why the nursing home and the seniors living there are so invisible to us? And why this isolation can, bring, can make them the most vulnerable group in our society? And this is not the only problem for China. During our visit to New York's nursing homes, we heard exactly the same thing from the social workers and the residents there. People here don't talk to each other. Everyone just stay in their own world. And this is Mary. After recover from a stroke, her son sent her to the nursing home. Since then, he never comes back. And during her two months stay in the nursing home, she even didn't get any chance to step out of the facility. Mary is not alone. 60% of residents in the nursing home never get a visitor. And according to Association of Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology, 80% of residents in the nursing home have symptoms of depression. And during our interview, 50% of our interviewees reported to be lonely, and 95% of them say they feel being neglected. This is a heavy topic but we still find some joy in their daily life, that is food. For most of the residents, mealtime is the only time that they can have some social activity with each other. And expecting something different to eat always brings them some excitement. So can we elevate food to connect people? Can we elevate food to dissolve this social isolation? Our answer is yummy secret. Yummy Secret is a recipe sharing program that helps the seniors step out of their social isolation by sharing food related stories and coming together with each other around a shared love. We started our intervention by bringing in to the seniors a different food that they never had. And we believe that food always connects the, with personal stories and identities, and food can inspire people to talk more. It was our first intervention. We bring in noodles, which is a typical Chinese food for birthdays. And we get some really lovely stories about the birthday and the family festivals. This is the first recipe we get. It's called Julia's Chicken Palm. It's made by bread chicken, cheese, olive oil, tomato, salt, basil, and pepper. It's an Italian food given by Stephen. Julia is his girlfriend. They met each other in the nursing home. And since then, she comes to visit him twice a month from California. Last time on his birthday, she made this chicken palm to her, to him, and it was the best food. This is Lina. Lina comes from Georgia. Peach cobbler is always her family festival special. Her parents met each other during her mother was picking peaches in the peach, peach yard. And since then, their love story starts from there. I want to make the peach pumpkins from the peaches by it's not in season yet. I had to just pick her. I use the pan and then I add a little um, sugar, white sugar, brown sugar, cinnamon, nutmeg, a little lemon juice, and cornstarch to thicken the sauce to make the sauce. We got people talk to us, but we didn't get the engagement which we want. 
We want people to share to each other and listen to each other. So we went back to our research and we found a new opportunity. It is bingo. Bingo is the most popular game in the nursing home. It provides an environment where people can sit together. So we designed Yummy Bingo. We, we, we filled each grid with a um, cooking ingredient. And to win the bingo, people have to share their recipe and related story with these ingredients. And it works very well. The social worker, who is an expert in facilitating the bingo game, hosted Yummy Bingo. And the seniors were very willing to talk to each other in this relaxing and entertaining environment. They spoke about some traditional food for the festival, what they made to fit their children, and some fantastic food they have tasted during the trip. And we want more people can come into the nursing home and listen to their stories. So we selected once as one recipes from Yummy Bingo and for a cooking workshop. We invite some community members, families, and nursing home employees to join the cooking workshop, and that's them cook together. And ultimately, we provide a community meal time that people sit together and the seniors and visitors can enjoy their food and have lovely conversation. The senior said, Yummy, yummy Secret brought them a lot of fun, and they know more about each other. And the social worker, they also felt Yummy Secret helped them understand more about the senior's personality, family background, and their value. And for the community members, Yummy Secret also changed their perspective of the nursing home. And most of them said it's different from other activities they have before. And they want back to have another Yummy Secret event again. And unexpectedly, we also attract more another employees from the facility. They are very passionate about having conversation and interaction with the seniors during the mealtime and the workshop. As we quit doing our project and have a deeper understanding of the seniors, we found they are so interesting people. They have so many great experience, family memories, and different cultural identities. They want to show this for the younger generation. So we made some videos for each Yummy Secret event, and we created this website to document all the recipes, stories, and videos that the people can follow online to reach to a broader audience. We also design a guidebook for the social workers. They can download it from our website. It can tell them all the details about how to set up a Yummy Secret project in their facility. And so far, there are four nursing homes we are plan to have Yummy Secret in their facility in the future. And Yummy Secret is alive in the Alourish House at Harperville. It's become their new traditions. Every month, they will have Yummy Bingo Night and invite some community members, families, to come into the nursing home and join the cooking workshop and have a meal with the seniors. And in the future, we expect Yummy Secret can become a platform for the each nursing home and they can share their recipes and the stories online to bring the seniors' voice and value to the society. Thank you. Hello, hello. We're nearing the end. Um, my name is Mia Osaki. Uh, first off, congratulations to the class here today. Your journeys have been amazing, and I'm so happy to have witnessed it. I'm excited to see how you take what you've learned here at DSI out into the wild, and you guys have shown how courageous and dedicated you are to do that. And as everyone has already seen today, these designers take on challenging problems. And for this next group, they took on problems and encountered big issues that had serious consequences. Battling cancer, 
growing independence in adults with autism, healthcare in our prison systems, and reducing plastics in our communities, and importantly, our oceans. These are big, big things. You all have discovered that what you brought to the table is not just some interesting solutions. You now carry with you the knowledge that it's about designing with your end users, not just designing for them. And when you do that, unexpected outcomes happen. And that's when it gets really fun and meaningful. By listening and co-designing something, you can really hear what people want, and you listen, and you find out what they need. The first presentation is by Molly and Nick. You both are fearless. Nick and Molly embedded themselves in a community to help adults living with autism design their own solution. And what did they want? A MacGuffin. If you don't know what that is, you'll be delighted when you find out. Pim, you've tackled the problem that's been on all of our minds lately. How can we change our everyday behaviors so that we can protect our world from turning into a plastic wasteland? Pim's hard work took her from food delivery, again, there's a lot of food tonight, um, to the Queen's Night Markets, and in a genius move into the little hearts and big minds of our next generation of change makers. Stephen and Hudia, you've gone to the root of the problem by asking, what does it mean to survive cancer? You never stop questioning, never stop listening, never stop thinking to uncover how will patients and really people find the support that matters the most so that they can get back to what's important to them. And Sophia and Jesse, guys, you remind us all that healthcare is a human right, and that really touched me. They take us on a journey to advocate for new approaches to make our prison healthcare system safer and more compassionate. A fellow designer of mine recently described doing social design as finding the right amount of meaningful. And I think you'll agree that these students all have found it. Thank you so much for inspiring me this year, changing my thinkings and my behaviors. I wanted to say thanks to Cheryl, Archie, Benedetta, Jeff, Jeff and music, um, for all your support um, as a thesis team. I couldn't have done it without you. I'm really proud to welcome our final group up to the stage. Good afternoon, my name is Nick. And I'm Maria Alejandra, or Male, as most of you in this room know me. And today we wanna talk to you about the 168 Americans or the 125,000 New Yorkers who live along the autism spectrum. Many of whom are adults, um, adults filled with a desire to relate to others, but born with a brain that makes it hard. One of them is our friend Arturo, and Arturo is like you and me in many ways. He likes cars, he likes music, pets, technology, being with friends. In our ways, he's different. Um, his differences are highlighted by the challenges of autism. These challenges make him feel tired and frustrated when socializing. And after trying to belong, um, he feels isolated. In his own words, he explained to us his experience. I'm able to do things as an individual, but my struggle is communicating. I have issues with dialogue, connecting with feelings, and understanding emotions. There's still a lot to learn about this. I can only go so far. This is a learning process. I have to go step by step, not beat myself up. And yes, it's true, but it's just Arturo's experience. And autism is a spectrum. There's a saying, if you met one person with autism, well, surprise, surprise, you met one person with autism. Um, despite that, we discovered one thing that Arturo and his peers shared. They're on a journey towards sustaining independence. What does independence mean? Well, to discover that, we conducted our research. And here, one of our participants explained to us. He said, I went to college to study English literature, and that was another isolating experience. I didn't make friends or any kind of relationships. I wanted to live alone, but my depression was a big obstacle for moving towards independence. 
From him, we learn that independence looks like this, more or less. Having access to a stable income, access to independent housing, and informal super systems like friends to sustain those two on top. And for people on the spectrum, housing and income can be provided and are being provided somehow. But informal super systems can only be grown by the individual. From experts in the social service sector, we learn that unpaid relationships and friendships are a more reliable way of supporting the community. Basically, the more friends you have, the better you are over time. But this is still not easy. Even though they have access to spaces to learn social skills, to practice social skills, and even to socialize, they want more. They want more conducive spaces to build interdependent relationships and informal support systems that they need. And this is where we focus our project. And so to get started, we asked ourselves a question. If it were easier for them to share their stories and offer support to each other, but they grow in formal support systems. We partnered with the Jewish Community Center, the JCC, and their, their pioneering program adaptations. We conducted interviews, we facilitated workshops and activities to make this happen to answer this question. We learned that we weren't doing anything different. Again, we were focusing on their diagnoses and not their passions, and that we're building space for them to connect and not to bond. So we flipped it. Our entire hypothesis changed. If individuals have a space to make where they work in teams on a shared journey towards a common goal, they will build interdependent relationships that they can carry on to other areas of their lives. But to make what? Our first prototype was a making event, a making challenge, where we asked them questions like, well, what do you want to make? Or for who do you want to make it for? Or about which topic? We displayed this content on this cardboard generating machine. Uh, and this was the moment where it became fun, not only for us, but for everyone. And not only we were interacting with the content, we were acting, interacting with the object itself, gamifying the experience. So we found ourselves with prompts that really spoke to the life experience, like make a set of characters for bad parents about patience. Make a poem for your inner child about more guys than women. Or make a graphic novel for models about guys in love with the same girl. And then we also came up with more off-the-wall prompts, like make a theme song for fat people about friends. Make a clothing line for Oscar the Grouch about trash in the streets. <laughs> or make an infomercial for villains about piña colada. We learned that the question wasn't to make what, but rather to make how. And that making was the means to an end and not the end itself. Yes, and like this, the Make Goffin project came to life. A relating by making program where team individuals explore interests and relationships around a sprint passion project. So it is inspired by the term MacGuffin, which is a um, storytelling device. Um, it's like some sort of goal or motivator that all the characters are pursuing, but the thing itself is not that important. It just helps to drive everyone through the story together. So how does the Make Coffin project work? Well, first, the community selects the challenge they want to solve. And like this, they're co-owning their programming. Then during the event, they set on a set of principles of how they want to treat each other while making. Um, this reinforces the idea that this is their community, this is their experience, and they are designing it. Then they group into teams. Every team is given a Mac generator. Mac generator is comprised of three card decks and the machine itself. Make cards, medium cards, for example, making Netflix TV series or card game or fake news posts. Four cards are audience cards for who you're going to make it for. So anything like DSI students or grumpy people or hipsters. About cards are theme cards. So anything from the 60s, our president, or being a normal 39-year-old man. They play with combinations of these three cards until they find something that they're excited about. And when they do, they display it in the machine. Then they collaboratively make to solve the challenge. Teams pass through a shared journey where they compromise and leaders emerge, experiencing emotional highs and lows, which ultimately facilitates bonding. Then they share these projects with the community. The space has no winners, no losers, reinforcing this notion of process over product. Without the pressure of performing, individuals feel confident and comfortable to stand up in front of others, to tell people about their ideas that they're proud of, ideas that they're passionate about. 
Then we collectively celebrate the teams and individuals with team photos, with medals, and a family dinner. And it's an important opportunity for the participants to reflect on the experience, share stories, and hang out together. So you might be asking yourself, okay, what are they making? So I'm gonna introduce you to David, who is gonna share with you uh, his team creation, a card game, where food groups fight for space in their refrigerator. Inside your refrigerator, a war is raging for the least precious space to collage between the moat and soon the blood, the, the meat fatty juices will be flowing. Who will emerge victorious? Will it be the meat groups with their powerful blood, with their powerful fat? The dairy group and their alliance with the fruits and vegetables, or will the pervasive junk food triumph as it has always, as it slowly invades? Coming this summer, be ready for a food fight. So this is just one of the many ideas producing our pilots. Uh, from our 28 participants, we learned two things about the MacGuffin. First, it positively shifts the emotions. For those participants who arrive feeling sad or feeling depressed, 75% of them reported leaving feeling happier or better. Also, it reduces or helps reducing social anxiety. For those participants who arrive feeling anxious, 50% reported leaving feeling not anxious at all, and the other half um, remained the same. We were really curious about the why, so we asked them, and they explained. I love collaborating on ideas in my group and talking to my new friends. I feel more involved. I don't know what I want to make with my talents, but I do feel less alone with them. We understood that these were stories about decreasing social isolation and increasing social confidence, which at the end are conditions for growing informal support systems. Also, leaders are emerging. Now we have volunteers who are running registration, who are setting the space up before and after the event, who are like sharing new challenges, ideas, um, and little by little taking the make off and into their hands. Um, when they assume new roles, this is evidence of bonding and interdependence. We believe this can be translated and adapted to other community centers throughout New York City and beyond, and that other people besides us can host it. So we created a playbook on how to facilitate your own event or create your own program, and like this, you could have your own make of We've already seen participants continuing these projects outside the space after the event. Therefore, we plan to make the material open sourced, available for anyone to download the card decks and cardboard machine templates online. And like this, individuals can host events through the center or on their own. Finally, new conversations are starting to happen at the JCC where Alison, the director of the Center for Special Needs, taught to us. What, you're say, what you are doing is on a new frontier. It's changing the way we program. And yes, it is opening new doors for less programming for and more programming with, and for understanding the impact that a people-led process can have in the way we think about service delivery. The McGovern project is just a more conducive space for Arturo, to build interdependent um, and informal systems he needs. It is bringing him out of isolation and is changing his narrative so that he can pursue the independent life he wants. We see this scaling to other community centers. We see this going out there for all the other Arturos, all the other one in 68, so that they can flourish, not only as individuals, but as a community, doing it the only way it can be done. Not alone, but together, as a team. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Papim. I raised and grew up in Bangkok, Thailand, where we have a culture to eat food together with the several dishes. I also grew up with a passion for food. And I also grew up seeing a waste problem in Bangkok. This is a picture of the Bangkok street. After raining, it's also flooding because the trash clogs the drainway. I came to DSI with a passion to solve this problem. 
And when I came to New York, this is how my meal looked like. I realized that it's more about plastic trash than food. I start my projects while looking into the trash at the SI. And this is how trash I produ we produce in one day. We can see 95% of this are from our food consumptions. Every time we eat, we produce trash. And from the Environmental Protection Agency, they report that 45% of the material landfill in the United States are food related, such as container and packaging. Also, 41% of the food online delivering for the to go and delivery in the United States are from New York City. It's, the problem seems small as a plastic spoon, but it creates a huge impact. Plastic produced from natural resources, it becomes commonly used in restaurants, food trucks, home and school. We use a plastic just a couple of minutes and then we toss it, which may some people may believe that it could recycle. But the reality is, when I talk with the Sim Municipal Recycling Facility, the largest recycling facility at New York City, they say that the all small plastics such as straw, bottle caps, and plastic cutlery will sort out because they are no longer cost effective to sell to the plastic recycle processor. They all go to landfills. So now I found that not every type of plastic are recyclable and not every type of the plastic, re the recyclable plastic are recycled at the recycling facility. They all go to landfills and then they go into our oceans. 80% of trash in the ocean are single-use plastic. Also, then our marine animals eat it and become poisoning. Moreover, according to the Oceans Conservancy Organization data, the plastic calorie is one of the daily trash in the oceans. And not only the marine animal affects, it's also returned in our food chains and treated in human health. I ask myself, how might we reduce single-use plastic involved in the food consumption? Then I start focusing at the restaurant. I interview restaurant owners and also employees. I found that with the practicality of the restaurants, they have to keep the costs low. Plastic is five times cheaper than other alternative materials such as biodegradable. Also, the food safety policy challenges people to bring their reusable items to the restaurants. Now I realize that it could be difficult to tackle and change the restaurant behavior. Then it's led me to move to the next focus group. It's customer. After I went into this customer, I found that they believe that the plastic calorie are recyclable. And also the unclear signage of the recycling made them confused about this and lead them to unaware of using plastic spoon. Then I went to Queen's Night Market to set up a spoon bin to see what the customer will react. The result is, I collect 400 spoons within three hours. It also sparked a conversation to people about how to recycling this type of plastic and also make them rethink before they toss it. But still, since we cannot recycle this type of plastic, the next solutions might be reducing. It's led me to focus on the customer who already carrying reusable items. I have my hypothesis that they're carrying reusable items such as water bottle because they care about environmental. But I found that even the small spoon, it's much smaller than the bottle, but it's, difficult, it's much more difficult for them to start carrying. Because by carrying the water bottle, it's benefits for them. They can save costs and also it's more convenient. But for the small plastic spoons, some people mentioned about a difficulty of washing and also they can get it for free. Now I found that it might be hard to change the adult's behavior. However, I observed a recycling education at Sim Municipal Facility and found a new cohort that would love to work with me in this project. It's kids. And why kids? They are open and eager to learn about plastic reductions. I believe that they use a plastic every day, but not by their choice. They're given a plastic spoon by parents and teachers. And also, they have an influence to, other, to influence others. As a shy power, they can influence others 
who buy plastic product to stop using it. How might we empower kids to speak about their concern and make their own decision over plastic consumptions? I work with Wat Puta Thai Thawon Vanara, a Thai temple in Queens. They have a Saturday school where kids 6 to 10 years old will come to learn Thai language and also Thai cultures. After working with them, I found that after they finish the class, the kids are given the dinner with the disposable spoon, cups, and bowl every week. Then let me introduce you the Guidance of the Oceans Club. It's a program in the school that empowers kids to speak about the current plastic issue in order to encourage them to make their own solution toward reducing their single-use plastic in order to save their beloved marine animals and also influence others to do the same. From the several weeks that I worked with them, I found that when I tell them about the plastic current situations and also the effect in the oceans, after I show them the picture of the marine animal hurt by plastic, they were shocked and they really want to help them. Second, every time I go to class, the kids will come to me and tell me a story about their school or their friends. I realized that kids six to 10 have a different learning ability, but they all love to telling a story. Once I give her girl an opportunity to be a teacher in the class, she really enjoy it and make a great job. Then another girl asks to do the same for the next week. So I see this as an opportunity to leverage how kids love telling the story, to make them more confident to become a leader and speak about the plastic message. Then when I show them about the picture of the marine animals, they want to help them, and so I ask them, how can you help them? This is also the kid's idea. They are really are eager and get easily motivated to create their own idea. They start sharing what they learn from the school about plastic debris, and they also discuss about each other's solutions. Last, they need to connect the daily behavior because they cannot see how they can create an impact in this problem. Now, let's come to the action kids. Using us as a tool to teach kids and empower them to draw and be a storyteller. Use a marine animal as a motivation for them to reduce reducing their plastic use. Empower them to be a marine rescuer and create their own solutions. And help them to see the impact from their daily behavior. And how does this work? First, kids will join the club then they will track what's their current plastic use and it's turned from using into reducing so they can see by just changing one behavior they can save so much of the spoons. Then they will learn about the plastic situations by coloring and illustrations of the current situations such as a spoon journey. Then they will have an opportunity to create their own solutions by writing what they want to do for the next couple of weeks and pledge it. Also, they are assigned to get a signatures from parents. By doing this, it helps connect parents with this program and also introduce parents to work with kids in order to achieve their plastic reduction goal together. Then they will use this tote bag every week at school. Also inside the tote bag, have a small pockets to remind them to bring their own reusable item to the school. Finally, they can use that tote bag and also the drawing to be a communication tool to talk about this with parents and teacher and other people. With this piloting, I received a feedback from the school principal that once she tried to have the program that kid bring the cup to the school, but it's not succeed because kid forget. But by having these in interventions, she see that kids love this program and she see a need that kids really want to do it and would love to have this program for the next semester and would love to initiate a reducing plastic program at her school. Also from the parent side, once parent told me that she never aware of using plastic spoon until her kids told her. Also another parent said that this helped her have a conversation with her sons about school activities and also seeing his progress. 
She suggests that she would love to have this in a Thai version so she can practice Thai with her son. With all these clubs, will helping kids bring their own reusable item to school. It could sell five spoon per week. It's gonna be 200 spoon per month. And just one Saturday school, we can sell 1,200 spoon that's going to the oceans. Based from the feedback I get, we have a possibility to expand to another school in New York, such as Brooklyn Friends School. And I, I hope to initiate to implement this program back to my home country in another school in Bangkok. During this journey, it exposed me to who the opportunity to be a writer for the greenery.com to write about my thesis and also the research and the innovative waste reducing reductions program in New York. It's received a great feedback. From this, I believe that by spreading the information, empowering each other to have their own solutions, and everyone taking a little step with your own step, we can achieve the plastic reductions goal and make the world less waste. Thank you for listening. Hi. Hello. So we'd like to talk to you about what we've been working on, but we'd like to start with a, a few numbers. First, the basics. One in three people will get cancer in the US in their lifetime, and many of them are young, like our age. And we also know that for each of the 15 million people right now in this country who have cancer, there are, are just as many who already have and survived. And that number of survivors is rising really fast, and that's actually who we'd like to talk with you about today. So with a one in three chance, we'd like you to imagine that it happens to you, and one day your doctor tells you, you have cancer. So you imagine immediately wanting to live, of course. But what's next? How do you talk about this with people? Imagine worrying that you'll be fired from the job that now you really need, or the shock of some of your friends, your closest friends, suddenly disappearing, some of your family treating you as if you're contagious or as if you're broken, being told by experts, to keep this whole cancer thing a secret, going through all that and more, and then at the end of treatment, finding that it worked and that you have no more cancer. And is any of that as shocking as this? But virtually every survivor, and we checked again and again, told us that this is true, that often experiencing survival can be worse than the experience that they had in treatment. Why? Working with around 50 people over the last year, a story took shape for us that contradicted some of our assumptions and made us wonder why there's so little support for people who have survived cancer. And when we asked what the problems were, survivors insisted every time that every cancer journey is different, and that's true. But for designers, everybody's different can be really tough to design for. So uh, we wanted to go back to the basics with these group of people and understand better where we might find some of their shared unmet needs that we could address. So, if your life is pretty stable before cancer, cancer is like a collision that leaves your life in pieces. And even as we get really, really good at getting rid of that cancer after it's there, your life is still in pieces. Having been treated at 23 for breast cancer, Jessica told us that the moment that she felt most shocked, worried, anxious, down, wasn't during treatment, it was after treatment was over, that she felt unprepared especially for the fact that that was when she would lose her job because of the cancer that she no longer had. And we also find that cancer survival often comes with a lot of serious and surprising side effects that impact everything, that impact your ability to do your work or your prospects for getting work at all. So when we asked a vice president of HR how people are coping, she told us that there is no tolerance right now for different ways of working. She said that negotiating law and policy was really difficult, and when survivors don't do it just right, that they can be fired and had been in her workplace. And that when she tried to bend those rules in order to help them, she actually landed in court. So in the workplace, we find that getting and giving help is really, really difficult and risky for both survivors and the people who want to help them. And your social support, on top of that, scatters generally, too. 
Every single survivor says that by the time they'd finished treatment, some of their closest friends and family don't even text anymore. And that's not just a nice to have. Lack of social support is so real a problem that it actually increases mortality for anyone. Some studies show that social isolation can as much as triple your risk of death. So survivors, survivors excuse me, need social support more than ever, but instead they're losing it. And so this is when we actually located that shared need. If cancer leaves your life in pieces, scarce social support seems to consistently keep it that way. So what helps connect survivors with support that they can trust to advocate for their lives beyond cancer? What does it look like to have space to rebuild and to be yourself? It turns out, counterintuitively, other survivors do. Megan, who's a 20-something survivor, told us that connecting with other survivors was a life-changing thing that she discovered because they just get it. Uh, you connect with them no matter what their cancer was, no matter what their treatment was, like you connect with nobody else. They show up and support without fear, without threat, without condition. And survivors, it should be said, hold so much collective knowledge and understanding about dealing with life beyond cancer that we really ought to be handing out honorary degrees as they come out of hospitals. So, we worked with an organization called Sharing and Caring in Queens, without whom much of this work would have been impossible. And they're an incredible nonprofit who's been working with survivors and with patients for 24 years. And while working with them, we found that they were able to build trust, to create confidence, to meet needs among survivors in amazing ways that we had seen almost nowhere else. And they did it often by being survivor to survivor. But this kind of survivor to survivor support hasn't really been scaled, and it's weird to use the word scale here, but it's true. For a lot of survivors across the country, these connections to social sharing and ongoing support can still be really difficult to find or facilitate. So what if we centered support on survivors by connecting them with others like them first, and then together to the people who have resources that they need and can use to thrive? Our early designs, focused on the majority of users who we found at one point or another are all going online to find information about their health, as we all do. But when you decouple that information at that point in their lives from social support, it gets really, really scary and potentially damaging. Uh, online, social support, if you're like us, the word Facebook is about to pop into your head. Um, and so we looked at Facebook groups, whether they're already being used or whether we should be. Uh, and it's not super hip to talk about Facebook right now and why we should be joining it, but uh, we still thought it was worth checking out because a lot of us are still there, and uh, yeah. We found some things out about that, though. First, survivors who joined great support groups on Facebook, and some of them were really great, also end up with a Facebook, Facebook news feed takeover, turning their Facebook into a place that is entirely about their cancer and therefore sometimes kind of depressing. Um, they lose the functionality that we all more or less enjoy from a normal Facebook. Um, second, privacy really is a concern for a lot of these survivors, and fear of disclosure is a thing that hangs around, and as we've seen, sometimes rightly so. And third, news feeds are actually pretty ephemeral. Um, and for a survivor, that's a problem because they can create great answers to shared problems that then can't really be found tomorrow. We also found that the impact of cancer more broadly affects people's lives than a lot of services have yet started to address. It really does go everywhere and impact everything at one point or another. So now we're asking, how can we build a space to be real without fear, to access knowledge and support, and to get expert insight when you need it, all to build a new normal that you can get back to? So we designed Headway that creates sources of knowledge social support, and self-efficacy through connections with other survivors. Headway is a collaborative guide for cancer survivors. So Headway supports users in three features. Beacons for exchanging short messages through quick ideas, rants, and challenges. Guides where survivors and experts can use Headway's prompts to build a collaborative guide to their most pressing challenges and caravans where survivors can search for and connect with support groups in their area. So let's say you're the survivor. You hear about Headway through a nurse, a social worker, your HR representative, a doctor, or even another survivor. So you download the app and get the quick tour of the features. The first thing you find in Headway is its beacons. 
So beacons is where survivors post and exchange quick messages with all survivors and where anyone can pitch in to respond. So in moments that you're sad or stuck or need a place to rant, you can pick the quick category in beacons and get a perspective from people that you can trust. So the alert that you posted then shows up in Headway's community. Then survivors can respond with insight and affirmation. You might think that this isn't much, but what you just read happened in our tests. And to a lot of survivors we asked, including the sender and the recipient, the ki this kind of exchange had a real impact. It's a light touch, but a high impact interaction. Next, you come to guides where you can find answers to the range of challenges you experience, created with survivors and experts who understand. As a survivor, you have needs and challenges, and you really want to communicate. Headway facilitates that communication by providing an easy starting point for their story. With prompts based on real posts by other survivors, you can build a guide to your life in survivorship. When you find a prompt with a challenge you have, you can browse other survivors' answers and save the responses that help. Plus, Headway includes a wide range of experts who, can, who are willing to volunteer their time to address these concerns. And survivors help each other connect with support and advice that they need. Finally, you arrive at Caravans, Headway's third feature. It's how survivors find support groups in their area. You don't want a life in survivorship to just be online, so you use Caravans to search a support group around you. You can check the locations, group types, and times. But if you don't find one that works for you or suits you, you can quickly create your own group and invite survivors to join in. So when, when, when a minimum number of survivors is met, survivors are notified and connected with each other. You can find and create new resources of local support without fear of showing up in an empty room. So Headway is a place to express, ask, explore each other's, and connect locally. It makes sure that your stories add up to something that helps you and others like you, so that your concerns aren't actually getting pushed down a newsfeed. So, and the dozens of survivors that we spoke to, including healthcare professionals, employers, and community organizations we've worked with, said they love this. In fact, we sent a link to our first prototype to just four survivors, and within 24 hours, we got responses from 30 survivors we'd never met. They said how they loved how conversational it was, and how easy they found to take part in, story after story, post after post. They love the Headway's resources are fit to their challenges and address barriers they experience. And they value getting to check in with experts' insights on the topics they choose while building the support for each other. We know that we can't always make surviving cancer easy, but we think about making accessing the needed social support in life beyond cancer a little less hard. So we hope that Headway is the very first step in seeding in this incredible ecosystem that helps connect survivors with the support they need in order to thrive in lives beyond cancer. Thank you, everybody, for taking such a long time <laughs> in listening to us. And we especially want to thank everyone who's led us here and made us come this far. Thank you. Thank you. faculty, family, friends, fellow students, we are honored to be wrapping up the DSI Thesis Show 2018. We are so close, 10 minutes away. <laughs> yes, yeah, so we will, we will keep you for 10 minutes only. Um, but before we celebrate, we have one last story for you. Before we came to DSI, I was designing public services and I was working in global health. Uh, we wanted to use this thesis project to bring design to people who didn't have access to it. And so going with the most extreme option, we reached out to two doctors who work in different jails um, to see if we could be of use. And we asked them, do you have any 
problems, and they said they had us covered. What kinds of problems were they talking about? People inside jails often really are sick, mostly because of social conditions such as racism and poverty. In this era of mass incarceration, these are also the reasons they are arrested and brought to jails. They arrive with high rates of chronic disease, like diabetes, tuberculosis, mental illness, and hepatitis C. So jails actually serve as a public health safety net for millions of people. 80% of them have not received care before coming to jails. So for providers who work in jails, this means that they have a big job. The question was, could design help? So the first step was just getting clearance to get inside the jails. Um, our criminal background checks took six times to get our fingerprints approved in three months. And they finally gave us our badges. So we have all of our supplies ready to go. We've been waiting for this. We head to the jail, we get to it, we get inside the door, and we're met by the correctional officers at the security check, who explain to us that we may not bring in all those supplies. Instead, a notebook, a pencil, and our badges, and our eyes and ears would have to be enough. And so, long bus rides that start at 3 a.m. Um, become our lives as we go into the jails to meet people that society wants to forget about. But not everyone wants to forget. We found nurses, doctors, pharmacists, technicians and counselors taking care of people when they brought to jail, when they come back for their appointments and for emergency treatment. The spaces also had correctional officers to maintain safety and we started to ask questions. What were their best and worst days like? Why did they decide to work there for 15 years? It was an intense environment and they were so dedicated to do their work. And they were also glad we asked. With an understanding of what correctional health service could provide, we went back to the doc doctors who we first contacted and presented our insights and told them what we heard and saw. And we presented them as opportunities for change, uh, things that we could address with this project, um, like how siloed departments hindered collaboration and how shifting schedules for patient appointments, the patients found them really confusing. Um, and we also noticed how the spatial design of the clinics created conditions that seemed to interfere with the healthcare services. Together, we realized that there was something different about spatial design. It impacted everything from patient experience to values to communication. We'd found our thesis topic. How might new spatial designs in jail clinics create conditions that better meet people's needs? And we went back to the jails now to explore every cranny of the clinics, not just one, but a few, to make sure that the challenges we saw were common. With maps in hand, we did interviews, we located the challenges, and then drew them out. I'm on edge when I come down to the clinic. I always have to watch my back in here. It's so hard to focus. Just things like orientation of the chairs in the cubicle expose patients to busy hallways. I do my best to mind my own business, but you're trapped in this cage and sometimes you have to fight just to protect yourself. Pens that are used for safety are actually causing stress and sometimes violence. We try to provide them with supplies, but the alarms are always going off and we get stuck here. The jail security alarms cause lockdowns, and when no one can move, things like medication delivery get delayed. But could new designs meet their needs? Staff used paper prototypes to explore ideas. If my office had something for privacy, my patients could feel so much safer. 
In order for patients to benefit from the therapy services in the jails, they need to feel safe in the conversations. If the waiting rooms could be outside the hectic clinic and just gave something to do, it would be totally different. Now the waiting rooms are inside and they only have metal benches in them, so it's easy for tensions to arise between the patients and the staff. It would be amazing if our departments were this close. We wouldn't have to work so hard to coordinate our services. Many services see the same patients, but without a chance to synchronize, the schedules are so complicated that it's really difficult for the patients to follow them. So there were so many ideas about the new clinic design, uh, and it was time for us to start drawing on a solution. So story after story, themes started to emerge. From our prototypes, we could see pattern of what unfulfilled needs actually looked like. So we have two deliverables for a thesis project. First, a set of principles to guide the spatial design of a new health clinic. So refuge, patients need to feel safe to focus on health care. Dignity, patients need to feel respected to not communicate with violence. Simplicity, patients need to experience care alignment to fully access services. Connection. Staff need to have opportunities to collaborate built into the workflow. Sorry. Um, for patients to feel safe, things like partially frosted plexiglass form privacy walls for every patient area where they're seen. And this way, um, the patients can feel safe and the clinics can still have oversight. Small waiting rooms outside the clinic are libraries and living rooms, treating patients like people instead of liabilities. If you're treated with respect, you don't need to use violence to communicate your needs. What happened? Um, simplicity. When patients have multiple appointments, the clinics are now in a cluster, a one-stop shop, and it makes it so much easier for the patients to get to all their appointments. And staff conference rooms and break rooms are shared and centralized, creating natural opportunities for, for conversations and meetings. The healthcare becomes more efficient and the teams becomes more effective. So, so, this clinic design is just a start. It doesn't represent all the ideas that we heard and it doesn't meet every need that we heard either. But as one provider said, now that could actually work. Could it work? Where does our work fit in the world today? We're not the only one looking at jail design. Because of mass incarceration and the dire need for criminal justice reform, governments, agencies, and private firms are brainstorming new jails. We think our work offers two missing pieces, though, things that are vital. First, everyone agrees that these should be spaces of rehabilitation. We learned that for many people, rehabilitation means getting access to medical and mental health support. Yet, these proposals don't often emphasize, or let alone mention, healthcare spaces. We think this is potentially quite dangerous for the people who would be most impacted by the new facilities, the patients and the providers. So second, and maybe not unrelated, uh, the proposals seem disconnected from reality because they do not talk about what people inside jails actually need. So are the problems understood? Like most social problems, the people who are closest to them have the most knowledge about the problems, but the least power to solve them. With emphasis on healthcare spaces and by leveraging essential expertise, we think our work is cutting edge and crucial to the future, not because it has the latest technology or the most refined plans, but because it is led by the people who have the best understanding of the problems we're all trying to solve. So what do they need to solve them? Just ask.
You were misled a little bit um, by that last 10 minutes, but we're almost done. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, is, um, this has been a really emotional afternoon, and I have to say that in the last four and a half hours, you have made every day of the last nine years that we've been working on getting the program to this point worth it. All of the sleepless nights and early mornings and late nights. So thank you. I'm really honored by what you've done and to have known you. And I wish you Godspeed out in the world. Thank you. We'll miss you. Uh, we have a tradition, though, and that is that every year the first-year students make a film in honor of the graduating students. So we should roll that now. You're no doubt feeling a lot of emotions today. Euphoria, happiness, anxiety, fear. Soon, you're gonna be out in the world facing a whole new set of challenges. We want you to use what you've learned here to guide you, and remember, you've got this. When you feel overwhelmed, stand outside and look at the sky. Remember how tiny we are, how huge the world is, and how we all fit into the perfect place for us. You're right where you're supposed to be, doing the best you can. When you feel hopeless, remember the words of Martin Luther King, only when it is dark enough can you see the stars. When you feel weak, remember to hug yourself and remember the word of Maria Monroe, we are all of us stars and we deserve to twinkle. When you feel exhausted, remember to take a deep breath, eat better and sleep more. When you feel self-conscious, remember you can shed your insecurities with practice. The author Jedediah Jenkins said, you are most lovely when you forget to pretend. When you feel doubtful, remember that doubt kills more dreams than failure ever will. Don't let it keep you from achieving your greatest aspirations. When you feel embarrassed, remember that embarrassing moments are the best way to remember your special moments. These moments give you more stories to put in your archives. When you feel stuck, remember that constraints can actually lead to more creativity. Embrace it and frame it as a challenge. Your best idea might be just around the corner. When you feel pessimistic, remember what the writer Robert Brault said. The average pencil is seven inches long with only a half inch eraser, in case you thought optimism is dead. When you feel anxious, remember do not overthink and do the right thing at that moment. Time will answer what you need. When you feel frustrated, take a minute, or an hour, or a day. Cry, rant, rave, and then go back at it, because you and I know you got this. When you feel worn out, remember to take some time for yourself so you can come back refreshed. When you feel skeptical, well, just be it and carry on. Let the time give you the answer. When you feel conflicted, remember when you first saw our classes how confused you felt about them. Now you are graduating and you made it. When you feel defeated, remember to take a step back and be kind to yourself. When you feel lonely, come back to DSI. We'll be here. When you feel uninspired, you can always come back to DSI and talk to us or take a walk. When you feel depressed, go out, be in the nature, talk to random people, because we all know there is happiness in every little thing. When you feel uncertainty, like if you want fried chicken or pizza, just remember to believe in yourself. When you feel vulnerable, remember Han and Mark's class. As Brene Brown says, vulnerability is the birthplace of innovation, creativity, and change. Take a breath, trust yourself. When you feel hesitant, remember to trust the process. We learn by doing, and you've already done so much to get where you are. When you feel stressed, remember to go outside and reconnect with nature. And always take a breath. When you feel impatient, remember to stay focused. Stay true to yourself and remember your why. The universe will give you the gas for the car. You just need to get in it. 
When you feel tired, remember to put a candy in your mouth. Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and put on your favorite song. It's okay to feel tired. When life gives you lemons, throw them back. Thank you all for coming. Thank you again to our fabulous thesis faculty. And we're going to do a group photo on the stage. Um, so see you next year. <laughs> <laughs>